All right, patient assessment. So you guys will be expected to do patient assessments by the end of this course, okay? Uh, you will have to do a trauma and a medical assessment. Usually, I believe it's gonna be like the third to last class. So you have your assessments, we have a, a final study day, and then we have our final day, okay? So you got plenty of time on those, but we're just introducing the concepts early because you guys will start to see um, what we call order of operations questions showing up, okay? And those order of operations questions are all tying back into this assessment, okay? Now, when we talk about assessments, we're also talking about kind of the, the order of events that things should be kind of handled when you guys are out there, okay? And more so, we're doing this, or we're gonna, one, obviously, to do the job, but two, we're trying to burn this into your mind now because it's gonna happen where you guys walk into the field, it's your first call, and you say, hey, my name's so-and-so, I'm with so-and-so, and then everything you know is a whiteboard, okay? It happens all the time. This gives you a point to fall back on when you don't know what your next question is, okay? so. And then just obviously, like I said, order of operations, you'll see these questions potentially popping up on your benchmark, hint, hint, wink, wink, upcoming. So patient assessment, very important. You EMTs must master the assessment process. You guys we're, are not expected to be masters of this by the end of this course, okay? We just expect you to be um, proficient, okay? To the point where, you know, if you were to compare you guys doing an assessment to Chris or myself or Justin, uh, it's not gonna sound anywhere near the same, but you gotta remember we've done thousands of these in real life, okay? So it's a little bit different. Now, it says to some degree patient assessments used. In every encounter, you're gonna have to use an assessment, right? You're gonna have to assess whether they need to go with us. You're gonna have to assess what our treatments are gonna look like. Assessments are gonna be used every single time, okay? So start getting familiar with the concept of assessing them. So when we talk about the assessment, we break it down into these five parts. Okay, if you guys, oh, before we get too far, if you have your highlighted packets, pull those out. Um, on the last two pages, you'll see the assessment sheets and you can kind of track along and you can see what those look like and what our expectations are of you guys with these concepts, okay? <clears throat> if you don't got it, no worries. Uh, this guy, got it on the first day. Yeah, anyone need one? There you go. It should be one of the last two pages, the one with the highlighted front page. But just pull those out. Those ones are a little specific to trauma and medical, but both of them are gonna cover these five areas. Okay, now, um, if you guys look to the fourth bullet, the secondary assessment, that's where it kind of takes a turn more so between trauma and medical, right? Sometimes in medical, well, let me rephrase. In trauma, if we're missing something, we gotta get hands on, right? We don't wanna miss anything. Let's feel them. Let's see if we're, you know, if we find anything broken. Versus a medical call, there's not always a reason to get hands on with a patient, right? If someone's having a low blood sugar event, do you think there's any reason to palpate anything? Probably not, right? Nothing's physically wrong. But these that's where the assessment kind of takes a turn, okay? So the five main parts, the scene size up, the primary assessment, our history taking, our secondary assessments, and then our reassessment. okay? Five main components. Now, rarely does one sign or symptom show you the patient's status or underlying problem. Okay, now when we talk about signs and symptoms, you guys have probably heard those kind of con conform together as whenever you've heard it, doctor's office, whatever. But I need to get the understanding of signs and symptoms are different, okay? A symptom is subjective, right? That's what the, the patient feels and tells you about. Things like nauseous. Can someone give me another potential symptom? We can't see it, but they're complaining of it. Pain. pain. That's another good one, right? Though we could maybe see pain, right? But I'll tell you about that one later. What's another one? Headache. Like a headache, yeah, right? So those things that we might not be able to see, they're going to have to tell us. That is a symptom, right? versus a sign is an objective condition that you can observe about the patient. Okay, so can someone tell me an example of a sign? Cut. A cut, right? If they're bleeding, that's a pretty good sign that something's going on, right? Or even with pain, going back to you, Chance, right? Pain, they start sweating and getting that pale look. That's a pretty good sign that they're probably not doing well, right? So, and once you guys get comfortable with this concept, you'll be able to understand pretty quickly that the translation from school to real life is a little different. 
okay, frankly, you have a big disadvantage while you're in school because you can't see anything, right? We're giving you mannequins that look like that guy. I say, that guy's got a sword sticking out of his chest. Does he obviously? No, right? But it's time to play pretend. Things are harder versus if I walk up in real life, it's like, that's a sword in that guy's chest. You can identify that pretty quick, right? Um, and I'll show you guys another little assessment thing in a little bit that you can get a lot of information very quickly. Actually, I'll just do it right now. Dominic. So walk up. Hi, my name is Wade. What's your name? Dominic. Nice to meet you. See, I'm doing this right here. Right now, I've got a few different things, right? I felt his pulse. I knew that he has, he's given me express consent, right? He's reaching out, he's shaking my hand, right? I know his skin is warm, I know he's not sweaty. I know he's, can make, or he's conscious enough to understand what I'm saying to him, right? All of that in less than five seconds, okay? These are, this is where the advantage of real life starts to play a role, right? When you guys get out there, things are gonna get a little easier. But until then, you gotta leverage your imagination a little bit, okay? Start thinking about questions that you would like to ask if you could see it right? But I digress for right now. So scene size up your evaluation of the conditions in which you will be operating. Okay. So the situational awareness starts popping up. You guys are going to be put in some hairy situations from time to time. Okay. Not of your choice, but that's just how the cookie crumbles from time to time. But keeping your head on a swivel and paying attention to your surroundings makes a difference, right? Not only for our own safety, but maybe even potentially towards, um, like what, what could be going on with this call, right? If we show up to an unresponsive patient in his car, unresponsive person in their car, and we look and there's a lighter and some tin foil next to him, got a pretty solid guess as to what's going on, right? Or you walk into, a, or rather go to a car crash, you open the back door, there's four empty beer bottles on the floor, right? That's a pretty good indication about what could be going on. So by paying attention to your environment, not only are you gonna be protecting yourself in case something goes sideways, but you can be doing yourself a favor by seeing what could be going on with your patient, okay? Now, the scene size up combines an understanding of the situation and, and conditions prior to your responding, okay? Those, that will be given to you through the dispatcher's basic information. Um, when you guys get dispatched to a call, you will have what's called an MDT. MDTs are little computers you see, the police, most frequently you see them with the police cars. You don't see the one in the ambulance as well, but the little laptop the cops are on, right? Do you guys call it MDT? Yeah, so the, the MDT is basically where you'll get your dispatch information. The caller will call into dispatch, they'll be writing everything they say, and you will be getting a line for line breakdown. Now, take dispatch notes with a grain of salt, okay? They are trying their best, but they are oftentimes wrong, okay? So like a good example of that, if someone's having, having a full-blown anxiety panic attack, right? They're hyperventilating, they are freaking out and they get on the phone to call 911 and they're breathing heavy into that phone, they probably think it's a breathing problem, right? They're in panic mode. They might not be able to get the words out, so dispatch is gonna dispatch you to shortness of breath. And when you get there, it's like, oh, this is a panic attack, right? It's two different things, but they're doing their best on the phone, okay? So cut them some slack. Um, another thing, if you're not, familiar, or not good with putting words together with misspellings, I would start maybe practicing that because dispatch is typing fast um, and they make spelling mistakes. And then observing your scene, right? Once again, you wanna play it safe, you wanna make sure it's safe. Another thing with your scene observation is it's pretty easy to tell who's been in this field for a while and who's not just based on the small observations they make. Okay, a good example of that would be a, a call my wife was telling me about, she ran, Medic Verita County. Um, she showed up middle of the night, of course. There's six cars in the driveway. Of course, there's always a bunch of cars when the person can definitely drive themselves. And when she walks in the room, she looks at every one of those cars. As she walks in the room, she's talking to her patient and he's, she's like, what hospital do you wanna to go to? He's like, oh, I'm not from here. She's like, I know you're from Washington. What hospital do you think you'd like to go to? He's like, how do you know I'm from Washington? The one car plates that were from out of state were from Washington, right? So paying attention to small little details can give you a lot of information down the road. Okay, so ensure our scene safety. Um, you guys are gonna get sick of saying the terms BSI, PPE, scene safe, okay? But it is a big deal. So issues and safety can be anything from minor difficulties to major dangers, right? Anything from somebody with a firearm to let's say you're on the side of the road, middle of the night, freeway, it's icy, right? Those are dangers as well. Um, now, for you guys, we are not PD. We do not carry firearms, so we do not enter unless it is safe for us to go into that area, okay? Um, to that note, you will sometimes, if you walk in and it's not safe, you're gonna go back to your ambulance and you're gonna call for PD, 
okay? You guys have to protect yourselves, okay? We cannot help people if we are injured or hurt ourselves. We're just making more patients for the next crew, okay? So you will not be going into a, sa a scene until it is safe. Um, more often than not, PD will get there, they'll give you the, what they call the code four, okay? Code four means it's good for us to go in, all right? Now, typically the way you enter an area is the way you will leave. You have to think of an exit strategy. That is a very important thing, especially when you're talking about potential calls that could have some dangers to it associated or some difficulties. I ran a call one time, we were the first ones on scene for a structure fire with a potential victim. Very first, we beat the fire department, we beat everybody. So we pull up, we're looking at that fire saying, sure enough, that's a fire. And there turns out there was no victim. A uh, guy thought his dog was in there. It turns out his dog was next door, so he didn't go back in. But when we got there, the fire engine came in front of us. Fire engine pulled up behind us, and they both rolled out their big charge hoses. Well, guess where we're not going, right? We're not rolling over those hoses. So we got stuck, okay? So you gotta think about that. You gotta think about your exit strategy, okay? And then wear a high-vis safety vest on roadways. Um, Ada County paramedics, I can only speak to them once again. Their policy is any roadway greater than 25, 25 miles an hour, you will be wearing a vest, okay? Make sure you put them on, especially if we're talking middle of the night, okay? I've personally thrown vests at friends of mine who work for Ada County, side of the road, rollover accidents on the freeway. We're all wearing dark blue shirts. That's a good recipe for getting struck by a car, okay? So make sure you're putting your high-vis stuff on as best you can. If you're going fire, that's gonna be your turnouts, okay? They're gonna have uh, reflective stripping on their turnouts. So terrain, big component, right? We, if we're thinking about an entrance and an exit, we gotta think about that. Um, if we think back to Christmas of 2022, it was real, real icy. I don't know if you guys remember, there was a big old ice storm that went out. I was working that night. I was working um, the north end over in downtown Boise. It was so slick outside that rigs were literally, we couldn't go anywhere very fast to the point where like, I was dispatched to a call in Star because everybody was out because of the ice and we were going lights and sirens 25 miles an hour the whole time. Okay, it's painful, it's embarrassing, but it is what it is. Um, but you gotta think about that, right? It makes things difficult. I had to take it that same night, I had to take a patient um, who had fallen earlier on the ice and then we had to try and figure out how to get a guy with a broken hip back to the gurney when his entire uh, driveway was an ice rink, right? So you gotta put that consideration a little bit, especially with weather. Anyone who's been a first responder for a while, I'm sure Trent's done this a few times, you look out the window, see it's snowing, and you go, awesome, today's gonna be great because everyone's gonna crash their car. Um, start paying attention to the environmental conditions just in general, right? Think of the things that you have difficulty with in some of these conditions, and then imagine we're applying that to the lowest common denominator of society, right? Sometimes they're gonna make mistakes more often than not. So, if appropriate, help bystanders, Okay, we don't want to make more patients. Uh, I have a pretty specific list I'll give you guys after this. Okay, but hazards range from extreme weather conditions to the threat of physical violence. Once again, you will be dealing with people you don't always want to be dealing with. You'll be dealing with people who just got in weird skirmishes or let's say even more so, or on substances, right? People on substances tend to get a little violent from time to time. And then an emergency scene is dynamically changing. Just because you showed up and the scene was secure does not mean the scene is going to stay secure, okay? Now, my list of who we protect, this is personal, but I would say it, it travels pretty far. Okay, so on scene, the people I protect is myself, right? If I'm on an ambulance, I have my partner, so me, my partner. Up next is gonna be my fire crews and my police, okay? From there, it's gonna be my bystanders, and the last person whose safety I'm worried about is the patients. Why do you think that is? Because if you're not safe, you can't protect them. Yeah, if we're, if we're sick or injured, we can't protect them, right? More so than that, they're already a patient. They're already in a bad way. We just need to avoid other people becoming more patients, right? It's just more work for us. The patients already we know is not gonna do well, so they can kind of wait a little bit, obviously, situationally. But when it comes to entering a scene, that is the list, okay? Questions on that? Okay, so moving on, we have to work, or we'll, we'll start muddying through the concepts of mechanism versus nature. Okay, now, 
you'll hear mechanism of injury or nature of illness. And if you can think about what those words mean, it might be pretty easy to apply one to one type of call, right? If we're talking trauma or medical, which one of those do you think is a trauma call? Mechanism of injury. So then by extension, that makes what a medical call? The nature of illness, right? Now, mechanism and nature are both concepts that you guys got to start putting into your mind and we'll talk about them, right? A little bit more, especially as we get to trauma with mechanism. Okay, but you got to think about everything that happened. All right, so if we're thinking mechanism, you know, and somebody was in a rollover accident, let's say they were ejected from a rollover uh, accident. Before you even get there, do you have the inclination this person could be hurt, right? Just based on the description of what happened, right? They're probably gonna be hurt. So if you can start looking into what's going on and thinking about the, oh, they're probably hurt because of this, that's gonna be the start of applying mechanism, okay? And then from there, we could even take mechanism a little further, right? Let's say someone gets punched in the face. Is the only problem their mouth? If they got hit in the face, right, they, that's enough force to potentially injure their neck as well. So based on the mechanism, you got to think about everything that could potentially go wrong around this injury, okay? So mechanism of injury type or amount of force, how long it was applied, and where it was applied to the body, okay? Now type or amount of force is going to be one, like I said, you're going to be looking into quite a bit. You want to make sure you're reading into a mechanism and not missing things, okay? So different types of mechanisms, blunt trauma, okay? A force that occurs over a broad area, skin usually unbroken, and the tissues and organs below the area of impact may be damaged, okay? So once again, it's not just the initial injury. We gotta think about that force kind of spreading through. What else could be hit? Okay, but with blunt trauma, think more like baseball bat, right? Baseball bats, blunt trauma. Um, penetrating trauma we'll talk about in a second, but it's pretty obvious, right? Um, now that's not to say uh, that the skin is always unbroken. Blunt trauma can be pretty intense. Um, I'll tell you guys a story when we get to trauma. But I talked to an Eagle Fire guy last year and he told me a call that they had just ran. It was probably one of the most explicit blunt traumas I'd ever really heard of, okay? but. Just because blunt trauma is blunt doesn't mean the skin won't be broken, just more often than not, it's, it's intact. So moving on to penetrating trauma. So the force of the injury occurs at a small point of contact between the skin and the object. Okay, this leaves an open wound. Anytime we have an open wound, we have a high potential for infection. Okay, because if we have an open wound, the buggies and the germs from the outside world can get into the inside world of our body, right? which is where we start running the, the risk of infections. Fun facts about infections. Infections are the number one killer of people in hospitals, okay? And that's also implicating us as well. If we don't do a good job of treating and bandaging and cleaning up wounds, we're not doing the patient any favors, okay? <clears throat> now for medical patients, any questions on mechanism before we move into nature? Okay. so. Like we kind of talked about nature of illness, we're talking more medical, okay? Now, there are some similarities between MOI and NOI. It's more so, can we think through the situation? Based on what I am seeing in a medical circumstance, based on what, I'm, what I am seeing, what do I see? What kind of process does this disease look like it's taking? Is this gonna be more of a cardiac related issue? Is this gonna be an illness related issue? Is this gonna be an endocrine related issue? Okay, you gotta do a little bit of digging still. Um, I described it as playing detective. You guys have to play detective and find lots of clues so that you can unearth your mystery. Okay, so talk with patients, family, or bystanders. If they're not conscious, you guys can always talk to bystanders. If someone witnessed it, if there's family there. Okay, now these are important questions also, or important concepts when we start talking about people with like dementia and Alzheimer's, right? At baseline, they are living a different reality than we are, okay? So asking their caregivers, asking family, is this normal for them? Is this how they normally behave, right? These are questions we don't know these people. They obviously do, okay? And then use your senses to check for clues. Um, I hate to break it to you, your nose is gonna be a pretty good indicator of things. And there are things that you're gonna wish you could never smell or unsmell, as they say. Um, 
But for me, like one we'll talk about it later is UTIs. Has anyone ever smelled a UTI or know what a UTI smells like? Dirty cat box. It smells like a dirty litter box. Um, to the point I've literally walked into calls before and been like, this lady either has seven cats or the worst UTI I've ever smelled. And I didn't see a single cat. So um, you'll get familiar with smells. And some of them are pretty identifying pretty quickly. Uh, what's another one? Well, dead body smells are dead body. But C. diff, anyone ever spelled C. diff before? You ever forget that smell? No, it burned into your mind forever. C. diff is a diarrhea disorder, and we'll talk about it. It's basically like dysentery. You poop until you die. It's fun stuff. Fun stuff. Okay, so be aware of scenes with more than one patient with similar signs and symptoms. Right? If we walk up into a situation and there's a bunch of people complaining of the same thing, we need to have that, that high index of suspicion that more than likely what's going on is affecting everybody. Okay, so the common example, carbon monoxide. If we're dispatched out to a carbon monoxide call and a family of four is standing outside and they're all saying, yeah, we all have a headache and we're nauseous, I'm probably thinking the same thing hit all of them, right? Um, or even say, you know, you're dispatched out to a sick person, there's a family of four outside. Oh, we're all nauseous and we don't feel very good, kind of lightheaded, and we look and there's a, uh, a stove burning in their living room for whatever reason, right? That's a pretty good indicator that there's gonna be multiple patients involved with the same condition. So this is where reading your mechanism, reading the nature of what might be going on applies, right? We can start seeing, is this crisscrossing into multiple avenues of different people with the same condition, or is this something kind of individual, right? But by reading into the nature or the mechanism, you can kind of tell just based on how many patients you have presenting. Okay, so important. So considering the MOI or NOI early can be of value in preparing to care for your patient, okay? Now you may be tempted to categorize the patient as either trauma or medical. There's nothing wrong with that. I will say real life is not as kind as school in this regard, okay? Now, when we give you guys scenarios in this class, you're going into a trauma, you're going into a medical. Clear-cut trauma, clear-cut medical. Real life is not always that way, right? Real life, you might have to do a little bit of deciding. The heart attack caused the car crash, the car, car crash caused the heart attack, right? You gotta kind of play that game a little bit more. But if you get into the mindset of, okay, this is gonna be a trauma call, this is gonna be a medical call, it'll start kind of tickling the red flags in the back of your head about the things that we're gonna need to do, okay? Now, already immediately, based on those dispatch notes, things like mechanism could be quick. You're dispatched to a four car pile up, three victims in each car pretty good idea what we're gonna be doing, right? We're gonna show up, we gotta start plugging holes and driving fast, okay? But if you get into those notes early, it'll tell you. It'll, you can kind of get, gauge where you're gonna go with it pretty quick. Now, standard precautions. Wear your personal protective equipment, PPE. You also might hear the term BSI, stands for body substance isolation, okay? <laughs> But PPE should be adapted to the pre-hospital task at hand. Now, hint, hint, wink, wink, important things to note. If you at any point are running through an order of operations question and they say, don gloves, that's gonna be your answer, okay? You gotta put gloves on before you do anything. Um, if you advance your scope past this, you might see it to a little bit more extremes. For me, when I was in medic school, there was a couple of times where I ran a scenario um, I thought I did really well, I get done, and my, my, proctor, or my proctor would say, yeah, you did really well, but you failed. I'm like, why? He's like, you never put on gloves, right? It is a critical fail. You will fail a scenario if you do not put gloves on. So more so, if we're talking about benchmark stuff, if you do not put your, your gloves on before initiating care, you're gonna get the question wrong, okay? Gloves have to be on. PPE has to be on. Now. Standard precautions are recommended for use in dealing with objects, blood, bodily fluids, and then other potential exposure, like risk of communicable diseases, okay? Um, COVID really changed the game when it came to PPE. Things like N95s came more to the forefront. Before that, the only time we had N N95 precautions was for tuberculosis. Now, um, we wear them, I, I used to wear them for most sick people, just on the off chance, okay? Um, and then fun fact about people who have like uh, venereal diseases, like blood diseases, like hepatitis, HIV, AIDS, things of that nature, is that they tend not to tell you until there's already blood on your hand, okay? So wear your gloves. If you're gonna get substances and you're gonna get all sorts of substances all over your hands, wear your gloves, okay? 
Now, when you step out of the EMS vehicle, standard precautions must have already been taken or initiated at minimum gloves, and then consider glasses and a mask. So when I was being dispatched to a call, usually because I was the medic, I wasn't really driving the ambulance that often, I would be starting the, the charts and all the things. But while I'm starting my chart, I'm pulling out a set of gloves for my partner, I'm pulling out a set of gloves for myself, okay, if not putting mine on. Um, from there, I used to wear a hat all the time when I was in the field. I'd put my glasses on my hat and then I would just keep an N95 in my pocket. Because worst case scenario, I'd have one if I didn't, if I, you know, I was really worried about it. Um, I would get in the habit of carrying a mask with you because especially with mandates, it's never a bad thing. Okay, it's mandates being like mask mandates. Um, especially if you're considering, you know, if you have family at home, you have kids at home, it's not worth getting your family sick because you're going to be walking into some really sick people with some weird diseases from time to time. Okay, you don't need to be bringing home croup, tuberculosis, COVID even to your kids. <sighs> Questions on standard precautions. Okay, so um, we'll talk about it a little bit deeper when we get to trauma on those and how the questions are laid out. But essentially, in any of our questions, if this sounds like care has been initiated, right, your partner's already doing something, you probably don't need to write, take on gloves or put on gloves. But if it's like you show up on scene, what's the first thing you're gonna do? Put on gloves, that's gonna be your answer, okay? You will see a question similar to that, I promise. Okay, so number of patients. During scene size up, accurately identify the total number of patients, critical in determining the need for additional resources, okay? Do you guys know how many people fit in an ambulance? It's about one. Sometimes you can get away with more, but for the most part, it's one. If it's a lot of people with like, I've taken people who got like stuff in their eyes and then someone else broke fingernails. Yeah, hop, both of you can hop in there, right? But for the most part, it's one patient. So if we're dispatched to an MCI, a mass casualty incident, we're gonna need resources. We're gonna need more ambulances. We might need more PD. We might need more fire, right? Just so that we can get the roads organized so we can make sure our patients are taken care of well, okay? Now, when there are multiple patients, use the ICS system, identify the number of patients, and then begin triage. We'll talk about triage, but ICS, on that same note, if you guys have looked ahead before our next benchmark, ICS 100 has to be completed or you will not be able to take your exam. Sorry, your benchmark. Don't want to give you anxiety too soon, All right? But uh, you, you are going to need to finish that ICS. You guys will have three ICS certifications coming out of this. They are lifetime certs, so just get them done, okay? You won't have to do them again. And then triage. What do we mean when we say triage? Yeah, first. yeah, list the order of importance, exactly. Um, I don't know if it's on this one, but we will t I will talk about triage in a little bit, okay? Okay, so triage, like Chance just said, process of sorting patients based on the severity of each patient's condition. I just wanna see if the next one, okay. Um, when we talk about triage, I'm just gonna do a quick outline of it and then there'll be another slide on it down the road, if not today, down on another one I can think of. But let's start the way, let's start easy. So we list it into four different colors. There's green, yellow, reds, and black, okay? Now green is what we call the walking wounded. Um, let's think of a good example. The Las Vegas shooting, right? When that guy was in the hotel room shooting all those people at the concert. Say this, in this circumstance, the shooter's gone. We're not worried about that. We just have a field full of patients. So if I was to stand right by my ambulance and say, if you can walk, walk to me. Even if you're hurt, if you can walk, walk to me. If they can get to me, they're automatically in that green criteria, okay? That means that they can get up, they're still mobile, they are a low priority for us, okay? That'll be our green. Our yellow patients, those are gonna be the people who are, are hurt pretty bad, but they are, they're non-ambulatory, but they, they still can wait. It's more of like a, someone broke their ankle, right? Their ankle's broken in a 90 degree to the right. They're like, yeah, my ankle's broken, I can't walk. But is that a true life threat? Not really, right? So that's a yellow. They still they can't get to us. They're still injured to the point that they're, they're manageable. The next one up is red. Those are the ones where we show up and we immediately gotta get involved. These are the true life threats. They are in respiratory failure. They are um, unresponsive, unconscious. Right? They maybe have injuries of some sort portraying that or linked to that. Okay, the reds are the ones that we go in, they need immediate care, and we gotta go. 
Any guesses on what the black tag means? They're dead, okay? Now, it sounds kind of calloused when we get into the moments, but you gotta think about the general well-being of everybody, right? There are times where you will walk up and you will say, oh man, that guy's pretty screwed up, but we don't know how many patients we have, but that guy's probably not gonna make it if no one gets involved. You may have to tag him as black and keep moving, okay? Especially, an example would be the mall shooting. We had that mall shooter here. Um, I know one crew started doing CPR and compressions on a potential black patient, right? But we didn't know where the shooter was. We didn't know how many victims we had. In that point in time, tag and move. You can always circle back and come back to them. If they're still alive, you can get involved. Um, an example of that one would be the Eagle shooter. My wife ran the shooter. When they, they showed up, they tagged him as black because he walked outside and shot himself in the head, of course. And after everyone had been taken care of, they looked at him and sure enough, he had a couple of agonal breaths. At that point, it's like, oh, back involved. Turn the switch on again, okay? You can always come back to a black patient unless there's obvious signs of death, like decapitation, things like that, okay? All right, so specialized resources. Some situations may require more ambulances. Some of them might require specialized uh, resources, right? Um, the hazmat team, Boise Fire has a hazmat team, Boise Fire has a dive team, Boise Fire has a moto team, right? Those are all specific to certain kind of niches, right? They have to fit into that certain perspective there. That's what they do best, okay? That is a specialized resource. So even more so than that, ALS for you guys, advanced life support, right? If you guys are in a situation where you cannot handle this within your own scope, make a phone call. Maybe we rendezvous with ALS uh, en route to the hospital. See if someone with a higher level of training, higher scope can get involved a little bit quicker, maybe make a uh, difference. Air medical support, things like life flight, okay? Uh, fire departments, so high angle rescue, hazardous materials, water rescues, and then law enforcement, things like the SWAT team. Um, what other special teams do you guys have, Trent? Is there a lot? Am I really behind the eight ball on that? Yeah, I mean, nothing as far as medical side. Mm. Yeah. yeah I mean, we've got our own mm. specialty units like DUI units. Oh. Crap like that, yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah, just curious. But yeah, like the TAC Med team, like you were saying, that's the Ada County and was it BPD or Metro SWAT? Metro. Um, but we have medics on the, t on the SWAT teams. They, they used to carry, go into the hot and warm zones, but you have to be an Ada County paramedic to get that job. Okay, so th that's where that specialty team idea starts kind of playing in. And then the Ada County also has a special team called uh, SOT, stands for Special Operations Teams. And they do like high angle rescue. So if someone like is dangling off a cliff off the Boise Foothills area, they'll come and help them out. Okay, so determine if you require additional resources. Ask yourself, does this scene pose a threat to me, my patients, or others? How many patients are there? And then do we have the resources to respond to their conditions? Now, some of these, like I said, you'll get pretty quick from the dispatch notes. If you're dispatched to a three car pileup and you know that there's four patients in each car, I would assume we're gonna need more ambulances, right? Before I even get there. And frankly, I would rather make the call early than late. I'd rather call them like, hey, there's three people involved in each car and we show up and there's one, vi one victim, one patient. I can always cancel them. Okay, but I'd rather have the teams I need and not need them than need them and not have them. Okay, so get in the habit of calling these early. It'll be for the best for everybody. It is annoying being canceled, but it is what it is. At least you don't gotta write a chart. That's all I'll say. Okay, any questions about the scene size up stuff so far? Okay, so if we look at those packets, that first box, that first six bo or, uh, points there, are all gonna be a portion of that scene size up. The one on the, the assessments page, so it'll be the second to last page on that packet. Okay, so the primary assessment as we work our way down, okay, so begins when you greet your patient, right? So when we talk about the primary assessment, the goal, I'll just talk, I'll, I'll use their definition to start. The goal is to identify and initiate treatment of immediate or potential life threats, okay? Can someone tell me a, an example of an immediate life threat? What was it? Collapsed lung. Collapsed lung, that could be one, right? 
Sure. That's another one that we could see pretty quick. Bleeding. bleeding, yeah, gunshot wound, but that's tied more to bleeding, right? If we see someone bleeding a ton, that's probably going to be a life threat, right? Things that we can start paying attention to early. So the way I think of the primary assessment is find a problem, fix a problem, okay? But all in conjunction with life threats. If it's something like a broken hand, a broken foot, maybe even broken ankle, right? Or wrist, those are all things that can wait. Those are not life threats, okay? But we gotta find the problems that are big problems right now. We gotta stop, we gotta stop the bleeding. We gotta get breathing going for them if we don't already, right? We gotta get oxygen going on. We gotta adjust the airway as needed. Okay, all different things we have to get involved with quick. Now, physically examine the patient and assess the LOC and the ABCs. So when we talk about the LOC, we are talking about the level of consciousness. LOC is level of consciousness. So if I was to put an A in front of there, so it's A LOC, does anyone know what that would stand for? Assess. What was it? Assess. Not assess. Think about their mental status if it's bad. Altered. Altered. Altered mental status or altered level of consciousness, okay? And then our ABCs. You're gonna get sick of me saying ABC, you guys are gonna get sick of saying ABC, but ABC stands for airway, breathing, and circulation. ABC is airway, breathing, and circulation, okay? All of these things tie back to perfusion. Remember when I was talking about that with the human body? Everything we do ties back to perfusion, okay? Can someone tell me what perfusion is? What was it? Delivery of blood. Delivery of blood. We can kind of expand that, right? We're dropping off. It's snowing. I'm sorry, I got distracted. Um, um, yeah, delivery of blood, but perfusion is the dropping off of oxygen, sugar, and taking waste away, right? The three things that cells need to survive. Everything is being tied back to perfusion, which we need uh, oxygen, right? Airway breathing, pretty important to bring oxygen in. We gotta be circulating blood. We can't be losing our blood to the outside world, right? We start losing our ability to transport molecules at that point. Okay, so ABC, big, big concepts you're gonna be saying a lot. Now, the order does kind of matter. ABC is how you're gonna be tackling this for the most part. You may even see it described as XABC, which I like that one better. XABC, the X stands for exsanguination. Does anyone know what exsanguinating is? It's bleeding all their blood. Like if somebody is, uh, or like the butchers, when they're butchering a cow, they hang the cow upside down, slice, slice the throat, drain all the blood, that's exsanguinating. Okay, so if we do XABC, we're looking for any major massive bleeding first, and then we can get into the airway, breathing, and circulation stuff a little more, okay? You might also see it go CAB and trauma, but we'll talk about that later. XABC still covers that same thing. Okay, so general impression. Um, that's gonna be a bullet you're gonna see. It's gonna be one of the first bullets under the scene size up there. I'll tell you what they want you to think of it and then I'll tell you the realistic way to do it, okay? So form to determine the priority of care, the first part of a primary assessment. So things to take note of, age, sex, race. Race is one of those things we don't really, I don't mean, I didn't always tab that one, but some people did. Um, but age and sex for sure, right? level of distress, and then overall appearance. Now, when we're talking about appearance, we're also talking, not, we're not just talking about their skin and things like that, we're also talking about things like their clothes, right? If we're dispatched out somewhere, let's say like potential abuse case of a child or something, and we show up and they're wearing dirty ripped clothes, they got dirt under their neck folds, their fingernails are long and grimy, right? That's an overall appearance where we think that kid's probably not getting the care they need, right? So if you can pay attention to the whole situation, you might notice a few things, okay? So note the patient's position. How did we find them? Um, avoid standing over the patient. You guys are gonna have to get down on one knee. You're gonna be down on one knee pretty frequently, making eye contact, having this conversation, okay? Um, try and get on eye level with your patients. Uh, try to use their name. When it comes to building rapport, people like hearing their name. I didn't write a lot on my hand near the end of my career there, um, but the one things or the two things I wrote every single time, I wrote their name and their age. Okay, one when I talk to the hospital, it's good to know their age. But two, I would say their name a lot because the more they say their name, the more they feel like they're involved in their care. Okay, 
Uh, make sure you introduce yourself. Ask about the chief complaint. So the chief complaint, can someone tell me what that means? Why did they call? Yeah, the chief complaint is what's bothering them most. Now this can kind of get a little bit hairy, right? If we show up to a situation and someone's like, I can't breathe, and they're having an anxiety attack, right? That's, that's their complaint is they can't breathe, but our complaint or what we think is going on is anxiety. But we have to register based on what they are complaining about, okay? Now we can make it make sense with what we've found, okay? But that's more of what the details we fill in the doctors and nurses with when we get to the hospital. And then address any life threats immediately. So extreme amounts of bleeding if they're not breathing well or they're not breathing at all, right? Those are all life threats we gotta get involved. And then determine the patient's condition. So you guys will hear stable, unstable, and then stable but potentially unstable. All right, so a stable patient, we walk in, grandma fell down, this is her fourth fall in two weeks, she's not hurt, she just needs help off the ground, right? She's in a stable condition, I'm not seeing anything looking at her, she's not complaining of pain, I am not as worried. More so than that, even if, say, they are a sick person, we're taking like a general, I don't know, we'll say diabetes patient in, and we get their blood sugar back to normal, and their vital signs look good, I'd call that stable, okay? Versus unstable, someone's bleeding out, we're barely getting it controlled, or they're not breathing very well, right? Those are things that are gonna make them potentially die. If anything can potentially lead to death within the next 10 to 15 minutes, that would be unstable. And then we have our stable, but potentially unstable. Um, a frequent call you see this with is heart attacks. There are a lot of times where someone's having a full-blown heart attack, but they're sitting there pretty cool, calm, collected. Everything looks okay. Their heart's definitely not doing well based on my EKG, right? That's, they're stable in the moment, but if they're having a heart attack, there's definitely potential that they become unstable, okay? Now, when it comes to general impression, you guys will get, we'll talk about it again. We get to assessments later down the road, but I want you guys to think of it in one of two concepts, sick or not sick, okay? When I show up, does this person look sick? If they look sick, I gotta get involved, right? Maybe we have to turn and burn a little bit faster versus if they're not sick, right? Maybe we have time to hang out on scene. You'll hear stay and play a little bit, okay? So stable, they're doing pretty well, or excuse me, sick, we gotta get involved. Not sick, we have time to kind of hang out and ask good questions, okay? So even if it's a trauma, right? So you're dispatched out to a motor vehicle collision, patient has two bilateral femur fractures, looks a little pale. I would call that sick right? So sick, not sick, that, that concept applies to trauma, but think, or to both. Just think of it from a framework of do I have to get involved immediately or not, okay? Especially when we get to the assessments, if you do not say a general impression, you won't get the point, okay? So when you say, mm, based on what I've heard so far, I'm going to say this person's sick or not sick, right? And then kind of prove yourself right or wrong one way or the other. Questions on general impression? Okay. Scan for signs of uncontrolled bleeding. Uncontrolled external bleeding takes priority over other assessments. If we cannot control bleeding, they are not gonna survive for a whole lot longer. Okay, we have to control that bleeding. Uncontrolled bleeding takes priority. Now, remember, when you guys get out there, it's not gonna be just you. You're gonna have a team of people. You can not allocate, hey, I need you to get on that bleeding. I need you to start looking at the airway. Okay, you can start dividing up and delegating jobs, but all things for sure, bleeding needs to be stopped first. Okay, takes priority. So the level of consciousness, LOC can tell you a great deal about the patient's neurologic and physiologic status. Okay, we can have a solid guess about what's going on with them based on their level of consciousness. And we'll talk about it with altered down the road, but there's a few things you have to do. So. Assessment of an unconscious patient focuses on airway, breathing, circulation, otherwise known as ABCs, right? You guys seeing where that's starting to slide together? Now, sustained unconsciousness should warn you of a critical respiratory, circulatory, or central nervous system pros uh, excuse me, problem, right? So this is gonna be falling under that sick, not sick. If we have someone in, sus in sustained unconsciousness, what would we call that? Would you call that sick or not sick? Sick, right? So you see how this is starting to play together? So yeah, if there's something that's telling you in your gut that things aren't right, trust your gut, okay? You guys have been people long enough to know when something doesn't look right on a person. Um, 
I'll tell the story again, but an example, I ran a gal who broke her femur. And when I showed up, she was sitting in a sundress on the sidewalk, kind of like a princess. And I was like, you know, she looks okay, but something doesn't look right about her. And it wasn't until I lifted her skirt a little bit and saw the 45 degree angle her femur was taking. I was like, oh, that's the one, right? So basically trusting your gut will get you there. Okay, you guys, like I said, have been people long enough to know that you can tell, just inherently tell when something is going on or wrong with somebody. Now, conscious with an altered level of consciousness may be due to an inadequate perfusion. Could be a perfusion problem, okay? Um, altered level of consciousness can be a few different things. You guys will come to find that a lot of these conditions we talk about don't have just one clear cut, that's it for sure, right? Things like nausea, vomiting, or a cough, or chills, a fever, right? That can be a number of things all across the board, okay? That's where your digging comes into place. So. I don't want to deep dive into too much like the treatment stuff. It's just more so we got to be familiar with their level of consciousness. Okay. Now then things to consider medications, drugs, alcohol, poisoning, right? All things that could play into someone's mind. Um, when people are intoxicated, right? They tend to make the best decisions in the world, right? Every time. So just keep that in mind. And this is also, we can tie this back into paying attention to your scene. Once again, right? You walk in, you see booze bottles everywhere. Pretty sizable guess as to what they might have been doing this evening, right? Now, to assess for responsiveness, we use the mnemonic AVPU. You're gonna wanna get familiar with this and I will explain it in a little bit. But awake and alert, responsive to verbal stimuli, responsive to painful stimuli, or unresponsive, AVPU, A-V-P-U. Now, let's say you're dispatched to a patient. When you walk in the room, you open their door, they're sitting in a living room, and they're looking right at you, just like you guys are looking at me, right? I would say, if I walked into a room and I saw a person looking at me, and if I took a step left, they follow me left. If I took a step right, they follow me that way, right? That would be an alert person. If they're able to track me with their eyes and have a conversation, that would be an alert person, okay? Now, so let's say a different situation. We walk into the room, our patient's down on the floor, eye is closed immediately do are they alert if their eyes are closed no right we don't know for sure if they're alert yet now let's say i walk up they still don't open their eyes but then i say hi my name is so and so i'm with so and so and then they open their eyes that would be an alert to verbal stimuli okay it takes somebody talking to them to snap them out of that unconsciousness okay now let's extend that same situation we walk in the room they're unconscious lying on the floor I walk up, they still don't say anything. I talk to them, they still don't respond. At that point, I gotta cause a little bit of pain. Now, when it comes to causing pain, you don't wanna leave marks, right? We're not, we're not hurting them, but we're just causing some discomfort to see if they re, uh, respond. One I commonly did, I would take their trap and I would try to touch my thumb to my finger through their trap. If you've never had your trap pinched before, that'll wake you up real quick, okay? Now let's say I walk up and I pinch that person and then they open their eyes they're then alert to painful stimuli, okay? They're not alert to verbal stimuli because it took me to cause pain for them to respond, right? It took pain to snap them out of that. And then same situation, we walk in, eyes closed, I walk up, I talk, I pinch them, nothing happens. At that point, unresponsive. Okay, I've tried the things to see if I could rouse them one way or the other with voice or pain, and it did not work, they're unresponsive. Now backtracking to pain, there's a couple different options you can use. Trap pinching is gonna be your safest one, at least from a liability perspective. Another really common one that is kind of going out of favor is uh, we take our knuckles and you rub them up and down their sternum. Uh, that'll also get you up pretty quick in the morning. But uh, turns out there's some pretty heavy handed folks out there and they left some pretty gnarly bruises on some old people. Uh, and basically liability starting to croach in. So if you're gonna sternal rub somebody, you're gonna have to do it firm enough they feel it, but not hard enough to bruise them, right? So that's kind of a tough line. So trap pinch, or another one I used to do, I used to take the pen out of my pocket, I would hold it to their thumbnail, and then I would, the other side, and I would press my, my pen into their thumbnail. If any of you have ever done that before, that also doesn't feel great, okay? But those are different examples that you can do to check pain. So once again, with AVPU, if I walk in, their eyes are open, they're tracking me, they are alert. If their eyes are closed and I have to talk to them to get them to respond, they're alert to verbal stimuli. 
If I walk up, their eyes are closed, I talk to them and I pinch them and they open their eyes or react in any way, that's too painful. And then if I do all of the things and they don't respond, they're unresponsive, okay? Now, the response doesn't always have to be like a quick jump to consciousness, like have a conversation, right? But like if I pinch somebody and they go, mm, that's a positive reaction to pain, right? Or at least it's a reaction to pain. I can note that responsive to painful stimuli. I was able to get them to do something with pain. Same with the verbal. If I'm like, hey, my name's Wade, and they go, eh, and they go back unconscious, right, or close their eyes again, I would call that responsive to verbal stimuli, right? They're able to react. They what? Have to be like fully mentally conscious. Mm -mm. No, they don't need to snap too, because it's certain uh, conditions like or situations like uh, low blood sugar, right? You can walk up and talk to them, and they're going to go, eh, I don't care, right? And they're just going to totally go back to what they were doing. But that still counts as verbal. Yeah. Okay, so different painful stimuli. This one also says pressing in on their cheekbones. You can do that one. I think trap pinching is gonna be your safest one and maybe sternal rubs, but be really cautious with that one. Oh, it even says pinch their earlobes, huh? What like a twitch? What do you mean a twitch? Just like you pinch your shoulder, can I just do that? Yeah, I would count that <coughs> reaction. More, I mean, you're not gonna be like, I'm trying to think around your question a little bit. If I was to pinch them and then they go, ah, and I stop, then that's one thing, but I'm gonna pinch them until they go, uh, until I get them to crank over, right? Cause the pain long enough to get the reaction you're looking for. Okay. Okay, so orientation. This is gonna start tying into AVPU and I'll explain in a moment, okay? But when we look at orientation, we're talking about their mental status. We ask them different kinds of questions, okay? And you're gonna to wanna to remember these ones. Person, place, time, and event. We have to ask these questions because these questions activate different portions of their brain, okay? And if we can get them to answer all four questions correctly, we have a pretty strong suspicion, that, or inclination rather, that they are oriented. They are alert and oriented to this situation. Okay, so for person, questions you can ask, well, what do you think a question we can ask for a person question? What did you say, Dominic? What's your name? What's your name? Now, could work, I don't like that question. Reason I don't like that question, I don't know your name from Adam, right? So if I walk up and I'm like, what's your name? And he's like, my name's Charlie. And I check his license and it says, his name's Adam, right? He just lied to me. So unless you have something you can verify with, I would caution you with that one. Try to use people you all know. So what do you think a question we could ask is? Who's the president? Who's the president? That's the one I used to use. Um, now I will tell you, we obviously live in a political day and age where people get upset with that question. So I used to preface, don't gotta like him, just need his name. Okay, because usually I'd be like, who's the president? They'd be like, oh, dad. Yeah, you're probably right, but like, what's his name, right? So try to be specific. The next one, place, what do you think we could ask? Where are you at? Where are you at right now? Maybe, right? If they're in their home, we'd hope they'd be able to recognize their home. But let's say we're out in the middle of nowhere, right? Where what are you? Are well, I don't know. What? What state are we in? Well, I'm sorry, Chance, one more time, man, I'm deaf. State, what state? Yeah. yeah, what state we live in, what city we live in. Yeah, all questions that we can ask. I used to ask what city we live in, if they couldn't answer that, be like, mm, what state do we live in? I would try not to range the country question because you're getting too broad, right? Very good, now time, what about time? What could we ask? What was it? What month is it, I like that question, yeah, what month is it, or what year is it, I used to ask that one. Say they're really struggling, you could ask, what holiday do we just have? What holiday is coming up, right? Those are good inclinations. I would very heavily caution you guys to ask what day of the week it is, because you guys have not broken your bodies down enough to the point to understand. But when you're on 24 hour shift work and it's three in the morning and you're on your third shift, you're not gonna know what day it is, I promise you. I had a Boise Fire guy walked in earlier today and I was like, hey, I need you on Tuesday or on Thursday. And he's like, oh, that's tomorrow. I was like, it's Monday. He's like, oh, you're right. I just got off shift this morning, right? He's not, you're not gonna know. So I'd very, very much caution you to use like, what day is it? Ask year, month, holiday stuff, okay? And then event. What do you think we could ask for event? Loud and proud. Yeah, you could ask, like, what, what's going on? Like, what brought me here today, right? Those are things you can ask. Now, different people ask different questions. Um, a lot of times when it was like, well, what, what happened? What brought me here today? Sometimes it's obvious, right? If it's like a car crash, it's like, what brought me here today? 
I don't know, could be anything, right? Um, some people, like for me, a lot of people did not like this question, but I asked it all the time. I'd ask them simple math questions. If I gave you six quarters, took two of those quarters away, how much money do you have? If they're able to do simple math in their head, they can put together an event pretty well. Um, and that's a question that is simple and as silly as it sounds, people will get wrong. One guy I'll never forget, I asked him, how much, if I was to give you six quarters, took two away, how much money do you have? And he's like, 47 cents. And I was like, that's, that's way more coins than I think I was gonna give you, right? But it can be difficult and people are gonna get them wrong, okay? So I used to ask that one. I know some people who like to ask this tricky question of, is Mickey Mouse a cat or a dog, right? And then they'll get that confused look and if they get that confused look of like, he's a mouse, be like, yep, you're pretty with it. Because you will have people who will argue, at least a dog promise. Um, but event, right? We got to see their person, place, time, event. Now, when we ask these questions, these are the orientation questions. If we're going to, we're going to backtrack here a little bit to AVPU. Okay. So actually I'm just going to do this. So AVPU, right? A V O V P U. Now for us to ask orientation questions, that patient's gotta be conscious, right? They gotta be able to respond. So what category do you think they're falling under? A, alert. A, alert, right? Yeah, they're alert. So if we have an alert patient, we gotta start asking these questions, right? The person, I'm just gonna write person, place, time, event, okay? Now, let's say person's alert when we walk in and we ask them these questions and they answer all four of them correctly. We are gonna categorize that, okay? as A and O times four. They were able to answer each one of my questions. Now let's say I ask them all four of my, my uh, orientation questions, they only answer two of them correct. What do you think they would be? A and O times two. What if I ask them all of them and they don't answer any of them? What was it? Time zero. Yeah, it's possible to be alert, lights on, nobody's home, right? Um, yeah, so A and O times zero. Okay, but you're gonna have to play that game. So if we walk into a room and a patient is alert, we immediately know we have to ask these orientation questions. Okay, because if we can get, make sure they're oriented, we know we're probably gonna get better information. Right, we'll get a clearer history on the situation. And we know we can ask the patient the questions we have. We don't have to worry about tracking down family or a bystander, okay? Any questions on this so far? Okay. Um, so these questions evaluate long-term, intermediate, and short-term memory. Like I was saying, they activate different portions of your brain. Now, to be categorized in that altered mental status, or AMS, there's any deviation from alert and oriented to person, place, time, and event. So if they're A and O times anything not four, if they're A and O times three, two, one, zero, they are technically altered. Okay, those are questions that most people should know the answer to. Okay, now we start running into some gray area when we talk about things like alcohol, right? Can an intoxicated person answer all of those questions correctly? Some of them can, right? If we're talking, I don't know if your guys' experience is the same as mine, but when I've ran on military members in the past, they say these things all the time. They can blindly, drunkenly tell you their name, their rank, all the things, right? Because they've done it so many times. And that's where it can start getting tricky. And then some people will be so drunk, they're definitely not getting them right, for sure, okay? Another thing, so if they're unable to answer our ANO times four, they're altered, or if there's any deviation from their normal baseline. Okay, this is the questions we gotta start asking for like our Alzheimer's or dementia patients. We never met this, or even kids, children even, but we've never met these people, right? Or hopefully never met these people. Um, and we show up, they have dementia, they're acting really weird, and then I talk to the staff and be like, is this normal for them? And they say, oh yeah, she does that every Tuesday. Okay, then I know that's a normal thing versus I walk in, I don't know, they're standing on top of a stool and their underwear doing whatever. And you're like, is this normal for them? And they're like, no, right? That would be a deviation from their normal baseline. So you can ask them, you can ask the staff, is this their normal cognitive baseline? Are they acting differently than usual? Okay. Questions on mental status stuff. Yeah, Abby. If you have a concussion, would you technically be... One more time. If you have a concussion, mm -hmm. is it technically in like altered mental status? Yes. Yeah. Um, 
that would fall under altered mental status because of the memory, which we'll talk about, but a lot of them tend to be on like three to five minute reset loops. Yeah, person, place, time, and event is your concussion question. Yeah, exactly. Yep, so if they have a concussion and they're unable to answer, immediately altered. But even if they have a concussion and they seem to be able to answer them, but then they're talking to you and they're like, what happened again? And then five minutes later, what happened again? Right, that's already in my head, like red flag, they're altered, something's going on with their brain. Does that make sense? Daisy. So what if there's like a situation where you go in and they're like awake and alert and they're like following you with your eyes and everything, but they're not like talking at all. Mm -hmm. Like they're just, you can tell they're watching you and listening, but they're not like mm -hmm. responding. Do you still consider that awake and alert? I would consider it alert, but I wouldn't consider it oriented. Right, that's the lights on or nobody's home. You, do you work in a facility? You, so you've seen it a time or two where you walk in and they're just kind of staring off and you're like, hey, and nothing. A yeah. and O times zero, I would, I would call that altered. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So identify and treat life threats. So here's just a few examples. Um, I'll tell you way more life threats in this list. But airway obstruction, respiratory failure, respiratory arrest, shock, severe bleeding, cardiac arrest, all considered life threats, okay? Don't worry about tracking this entire list. It's more so can we discover or can we put together this is gonna kill them or not. Now in most cases, begin airway, breathing, circulation, A, B, C. Now in certain like traumatic circumstances, for an example, you may do circulation first, right? You can do CAB. Why do you think we put the C there first? Because you need blood not bleeding. We're worried about bleeding, right? But then you could also do XABC and you hit everything at the same time, right? That's just the way I think of it. Now, with the ABCs, we cannot move on from the letter we are on to the next one until we have dealt with the problem. Okay, so we cannot move on from airway to breathing until we know for sure their airway is open and they are not gonna choke on anything. We can't move on from breathing until we know they're breathing effectively or we've done something to supplement that. Okay, and then same thing, we can't move on to, from breathing to circulation until, or excuse me, we can't move on from circulation until we know all bleeding is stopped and we've evaluated things like a pulse in their skin, okay? So ABCs, one at a time, you cannot move on to the next letter until you have taken care of the letter at hand. Does that make sense? Okay. So when we assess the airway, moving through the primary assessment, stay alert for signs of airway obstruction. So ensure the airway remains open and adequate. You'll see this word patent, patent, however you want to pronounce it. I've heard them a jillion times, either one works. But patent, patent airway means they have an open airway. So right now, with me talking this whole time, talking to you guys, would you say I have a patent airway? Yeah, right, I'm still able to talk and breathe and have conversation. Same thing if we, you show up on scene and you see a patient who's screaming and they will not stop screaming. Would you consider that a patent airway? Yeah, that's open, it's hard to scream if you can't breathe, right? I made that argument one time and I was kind of wrong and I'll explain that later, but it was a real hindsight, it's 2020. Yeah, so responsive patients. So patients who are talking or crying have an open airway. So watch and listen to how the patient speaks. If you identify an airway problem, stop the assessment and work to clear the airway, okay? But listen to how they speak more so from if we break away from airway right we can learn a lot from how they're talking to us if they're slurring words really aggressively what do we think might be going on maybe alcohol right could be something like a stroke right there's different things that we got to pay attention to but if you listen to how they speak it can kind of give you inklings right or even if we're talking more from an airway perspective or breathing perspective right um, it can tell us a lot about their condition did I ever have, or does anyone in here, or my God, did anyone in here ever watch Malcolm in the Middle? You know, Stevie, right? When he's like, oh, I don't think we could do this, right? If someone's talking like that, that's probably not a good talking pattern, right? That's someone who's struggling to breathe. So just by paying attention to that speech pattern, I know they're not breathing well. See how that makes sense? You see how they, that three, two to three word dyspnea, that difficulty breathing in between speech? For unresponsive patients, okay, immediately assess the airway and you will use one of two techniques to open the airway. Okay, you're gonna use a jaw thrust technique or a head tilt chin lift technique, okay? Um, before I get into that, the number one natural airway obstructor we have is our tongue. 
and the unconscious body of the tongue is the greatest airway obstructor. Okay, so kind of backtracking to jaw thrust and head tilt. Now these, once again, can kind of be broken down like mechanism in nature into a trauma or a medical category. So looking at those, which one of those two, jaw thrust or head tilt chin lift, do we think we use for trauma? The jaw thrust, why? Right, we're, we're worried about that neck, right? If we're doing a jaw thrust, we can adjust, open their airway without manipulating their neck, especially if there's potential neck injury. Versus head tilt chin lift, obviously that would be medical. So let's show you some stuff. Differences between the two. Uh, I don't like this one. I'm not gonna use this guy, I'll use this one. Okay. Can everybody see my friend with the giant head here? Okay, so don't worry about that. Jaw thrust versus head tilt chin lift. So head tilt chin lift, pretty obvious. We're gonna tilt their head and put their chin to the sky. This will naturally open up the airway, right? If I put my chin up, straightens up my neck, opens my airway. This is the one we're gonna use for medical patients, ones that are not, we're not worried about their neck, okay? The one we're gonna use for the jaw thrust. So you're gonna take your two fingers, you're gonna put thumbs on chin, okay? You're gonna take the, find the, the notch of their jaw and push it forward. You're trying to jut their bottom, bottom teeth out, okay? But when we do this to a person, we lift, and then I put two thumbs on the chin and I push, okay? So I'm lifting it open and I'm pulling it down. And by doing that, you're keeping that airway open, but we're not manipulating the neck, okay? Uh, you guys will all have time to play with this at certain points, okay? But you do need to remember the difference. These are gonna be techniques that come up quite a bit. Jaw thrust versus head tilt chin lift, okay? Signs of obstruction. Obvious trauma, blood or obstruction, right? If they have, if their teeth are gone and in their mouth or if their mouth's full of blood, right? Those are obvious ways that their airway can be obstructed, right? Or even if their nose is all full of blood, right? That's still part of our airway, okay? If you hear noisy breathing, so snoring, bubbling, gurgling, crowing, abnormal sounds, those are usually a bad sign, usually a sign of obstruction. And then extremely shallow or absent breathing, right? If they're taking very tiny little breaths, that's not enough to take a breath. You guys have been humans long enough to know what a breath sounds like and looks like. So if they're sitting there just, right, that's not effective breathing. They will not last. They will take a nap, okay? Um, can anyone tell me what the international sign for choking is though? Yeah, right? Everybody kind of naturally does this. Very good. Airway question so far. We're just kind of generalizing everything just so you guys are familiar with the process, okay? So moving on, breathing. Make sure the airway is open, right? Head tilt, chin lift, or the jaw thrust. Make sure their, your, their breathing is adequate and present, okay? So things to ask, is the patient breathing? Are they breathing adequately? And is the patient hypoxic? What do you think hypoxic means? Low oxygen, right? Do they have a low oxygen problem? Is it a breathing problem? Are they breathing at all? Okay. Um, yeah, I have something else, it's gone. Okay, so consider providing positive pressure ventilations with an airway adjunct. So. In a, in a conscious person, well, I'll backtrack. So respirations exceed 28 breaths per minute or respirations fewer than eight. Now, typically in my experience, when it comes to people who have a fast rate, well, first let's start, what's our normal respiratory rate? What is it? 12 to 20 breaths per minute, right? So 28 is obviously high. In my experience, these are the people that even using a BVM can be difficult because they're breathing so fast. These are the ones I used to put a lot of oxygen on. Let that oxygen catch up, okay? And then coach them through the breathing as best we can. Now let's say they're breathing that eight times a minute. Okay, that's not effective breathing. They're conscious. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take our BVM, all right, a little squeezy breathe bag. We're gonna put the mask on their face. We're gonna coach them through this. Every time you take a breath, I'm gonna give you just a little puff of air, just a little extra air, okay? Let's make sure you're taking a nice deep breath. And then over the next five to 10 breaths, you're gonna adjust so you're delivering one breath every five to six seconds. 
that rate is noteworthy. One breath every five to six seconds. If we're doing quick math, how many breaths a minute is one breath every five to six seconds? 12. 12, that's the high end. What's our low end? 10, 10 to 12, right? Six times 10 is 60, 12 times five is uh, 60, right? So 10 to 12 breaths per minute is what we're looking for. So yeah, with, if they're breathing slow as they are taking their breaths, we're going to give them just that little extra puff until over the next five to 10 of their breaths, we're adjusting so we are delivering 10 to 12 breaths a minute, okay? Now the goal for oxygenation, when we put oxygen on people, when we breathe for people, is to get that oxygen saturation anywhere from 94 to 99%. 94 to 99 is where we normally sit at with the SpO2. If you have a hard time with that concept, just think about what an A would require in a class, right? We want everyone to be breathing at the A quality, so 94 to 99, okay? There are some people that we won't get to 94, but they're kind of their own crowd and we'll talk about them later. Okay, questions on anything I just said so far? Okay. So observe when we talk about effort, right? Um, how much effort is required for the patient to breathe? Did I show you guys videos last time? The little kids having a hard time breathing, right? Yeah. So things like retractions, accessory muscle usage, right? Nasal flaring, so if their nostrils are flared out, they're trying to gather as much air as they can. Uh, that two to three word dyspnea, that's that Stevie breathing there. The, oh, I wanna go home, right? That two to three word dyspnea. Uh, if we see the tripod position, which is hands on the knees, right? I'm still keeping an airway straight. If we walk into a room and someone has not been doing any um, exertional exercise, and they're in that tripod position, they're trying to force their airway open because they're having a breathing problem. It's a bad sign. If we walk in and they're immediately in a tripod, we gotta get involved, okay? Uh, same with the sniffing position. If they're trying to hold their nose up, same idea, right? Opening that airway, self-opening, and then labored breathing. Um, think about when, if you've ever ran hard enough or when you've ran hard enough to be breathing hard, right? And you're trying to catch your breath that's labored breathing. But instead of them working hard, once again, they've been sitting on their couch for the last two to three hours doing nothing, okay? But they're working hard to breathe. Those are all signs that we need to get involved and we can help out, okay? We gotta pay attention. These are the things that we gotta jump in on. So, you hear the concept of respiratory distress, respiratory arrest, and respiratory, or excuse me, respiratory distress, respiratory failure, and respiratory arrest, okay? It's kind of a sliding scale. Arrest being the, the worst end of things, distress being the, eh, I don't wanna say the best of that situation, but basically in the sliding scale, they're not as bad as they could be. They're entering bad when they're in respiratory distress, okay? So their work of breathing increases, and then their effort and rate goes up. Okay, so they're working really hard to take those extra breaths and then to catch their breath, they're speeding or they're breathing faster, so they're speeding up their rate. Okay, that's the beginnings of respiratory distress. Versus respiratory failure, when the blood is inadequately oxygenated or ventilation is inadequate to meeting the oxygen demands of the body. Okay, so we are starting to fail when it comes to perfusion. Okay, we are not dropping off the oxygen that we need and we are not exhaling the CO2 that we need because of whatever reason, okay? And then the ultimate result of respiratory failure, if it is not corrected, is respiratory arrest, okay? Arrest means they are no longer breathing. Just like cardiac arrest means they no longer have a heartbeat. Respiratory arrest, they are no longer breathing, okay? So distress will lead into failure, failure will lead into arrest, okay? Does that make sense? Everyone see that transition of things? Okay. And we'll talk about it when, once again, we talk about breathing stuff. Uh, circulation. So when we talk about circulation, it's not all about bleeding, right? A big portion of it obviously is the obvious bleeding that we see, but things like mental status start playing a role in there, right? If we're not getting blood to our brain, we're not perfusing. We're not dropping off the sugar and the oxygen that we need to, right? So if someone has an altered mental status, that could be a circulation problem. 
Pretty frequently, you'll see altered mental status for, from circulation with things like heart attacks or weird um, heart rhythms can throw them out of, like in a weird consciousness state, okay? Or let's say we showed up and the story we got from a bystander is, oh, they passed out. We could assume that's probably a circulation problem, right? If I'm standing here, which way is gravity pulling on my head? Straight down, right? Well, let's imagine I have a low blood pressure. Do you think that that low pressure is gonna be enough to perfuse my brain? It's not, so typically people will pass out when they stand up with a low blood pressure. Okay, so circulation, mental status, those are tied together. Pulse, once again, right, we wanna feel for a pulse, we wanna feel, the, the, we wanna feel the three components, the RRQ, rate, rhythm, and quality. You're gonna to wanna to remember rate, rhythm, and quality because that also ties into our breathing. Okay, but rate, rhythm, quality. Is it at a consistent rate, right? We want it rhythmic. If I'm feeling it, does it feel like it's really weak? If we have a weak pulse, we call that thready, like string, thready. If we have a really strong pulse where we can, uh, basically our inclination is they have a high blood pressure, we describe that as bounding. Okay, so if a weak, weak pulse is thready and a strong pulse or an overly strong pulse is bounding. You guys will get to the point when you get into the field that after doing this enough times, you can actually make a pretty solid crack at someone's blood pressure just by feeling their pulse, okay? And then skin condition. Um, so blood does some interesting things for our skin. Two big jobs that it does, two of the many, but two big jobs that blood does for our skin gives us color, gives us temperature, okay? So if we walk into a room and someone's really pale, what can we assume about their circulation? probably poor, right? They probably are not circulating very well because they're not providing the blood to their skin that they need. So we can pay attention to these things and start acting on them. Has anyone ever seen someone pass out before? Do they go really pale first, right? That's a circulation problem. You can physically see that circulation leaving their face and brain, okay? So circulation goes far beyond just feeling a pulse and is there bleeding, right? We can pay attention to mental status and skin condition and those will give us a lot of indicators too about what's going on. So do I need to go into depth about what a pulse is? You guys feel confident with the concept of a pulse? Yes, no? Anyone not confident with the pulse? What's the three things you said before, rate, rhythm, and quality. quality. So that's where that thready or bounding kind of steps in. Okay, if we're feeling comfortable with pulses, I am gonna not talk about them. Um, has everybody been practicing pulses? Finding radials, brachials, carotids, femorals? Yeah? Any tricks on the, on the foot one? Yes. Foot? Yeah, so for the foot, um, I learned this from a ICU nurse. I'll just show you kind of. I'm not obviously gonna find my own pulse, but it kind of sits right in here. So what I learned was take three fingers and stretch them across that area. And then wherever you feel the pulse, like say I feel the pulse right here, right? I'm just gonna move my fingers to that point. See what I'm saying? So give yourself, um, and that's good for most pulses. If you give yourself more surface area to feel them, then you can just adjust to where you gotta go. Um, but those dorsal pedals are pretty tough to find. But they are one that if you guys have not been practicing, I would encourage you to do so. Especially if we're in a moment of pinch and I need you to find one quick, right? You wanna be familiar. Also, pro tip, keep a Sharpie in your pocket at all times. It's not illegal to write on your patient. Or draw an X on them where you need to feel pulses. Especially in cardiac arrest, right? The femoral pulse can be tough to find. So once we find it, it's not uncommon to put a big old X there. That way for the next pulse check, we could immediately go and feel it, right? We don't have to go digging around and try and find a femoral pulse again on a dead body. Um, yeah, if you have not been practicing femoral pulses, you should start. Okay, they're very, very important pulses to be able to get a hold on. Remember, it's that point right where your legs meet your trunk. Okay, so you're gonna have to dig around in there. It's tough to find on yourself, and if you can find it on yourself, start practicing on others. Okay, so skin condition, kind of talked about it, but evaluate their skin color, temperature, moisture, and capillary refill, okay? A normal functioning circulatory system perfuses the skin with oxygenated blood, okay? so. Color, temperature, moisture, cap refill. So um, color, if we see cyanosis, right? That blue mouth or blue, they're probably not perfusing very well, okay? 
Um, even times if we're thinking like, well, what's, what's a normal natural time for your fingers and lips to get blue? When you're cold, right? That's a circulation problem still. That's still, that, even on yourself in a healthy body, that's circulation, right? Your, your body's like, well, we're too cold. I don't need the tips of my fingers to survive. Let's start pulling some of that blood into the more important organs. Um, temperature, yeah, right? If, they're, if they feel cool to the touch, they're not perfusing very well because once again, blood brings us color and temperature, okay? And then moisture, the words you want, or the, the two trigger words for me, mm, two trigger words for me with moisture, were diaphoretic, D-I-A-P-H-O-R-E-T-I-C, diaphoretic. Diaphoresis being diaphoretic is like marathon level sweating with no activity. Just sitting there sweating and sweating and sweating. And then what is cap refill? Can somebody, oh actually, before I get too far. So um, diaphoresis and the other one was clammy. If you see clammy, that's usually a bad sign for perfusion, okay? Outside of that, in normal skin, we want pale, warm, dry. Okay, or excuse me, not pale, pink, pink, warm, dry. Pink, warm, dry is gonna be the description for normal skin tone or skin circulation. Now I will say, not everybody, if we're thinking skin color is pink, warm, dry, right? So make it make sense. Skin is of normal pigment, warm and dry. Okay, uh, and a cap refill. Can someone tell me what cap refill is? It's like when you press on someone's skin, uh -huh. It turns white, uh -huh. and then you let go, and the blood comes back, and it turns back pink. Yeah, that's exactly it. So we check it in their thumbs. So if you squeeze your thumb, it turns white. That white we call blanching, okay? For circulation to be intact, we need that white to dissipate. They need to be completely pink again in two seconds or less, okay? If it takes more than two seconds for their thumbnail to turn pink, they are having a circulation problem. They're having a perfusion problem, okay? It's also written as a CRT, capillary refill time. So when you guys get to your assessments, if you see CRT, it just means cap refill. Uh, so skin color determined by blood circulating through vessels, amount, of, amount and type of pigment present in the skin, right? Um, this is gonna be something, skin color is, is a tough one from time to time. Um, for me, I grew up in a predominantly Hispanic household. I know what it looks like when I get pale. I know what it looks like when my family gets pale. I had a real hard time with people who are very Caucasian. Like, is this someone who's pale or is this someone who never sees the sun? I don't know the difference half the time. So I used to have to ask a lot, which was embarrassing, but it was, it is what it is. But um, it's all depending on the pigment and their circulation, right? So if you can get familiar with what pale looks like in different people, that's gonna help. But the nice thing is, even if you can't, we still have a couple options, right? We can check that cap refill in their fingers, right? Or another one, you can pull down their eyelid and look at their conjunctiva. If that's pale, they're not getting blood to their face, okay? So that conjunctiva, the inside layer, of the lower eyelid or upper eyelids, I guess too, but the one we see is the lower. If you pull it down and it's pale, they're probably not perfusing very well. So poor circulation will cause skin to appear pale, white, ashen, or gray. I've seen people literally like, like this gray color before their circulation is so poor. Um, ashen is a good term too. You'll, you'll be able to identify pretty quick when someone's not looking well, at least I thought for myself until, unless you guys are from, you know, Caucasian and you can get an advantage on that one. Good for you. Um, but yeah. So pale, white, ashen, or gray, you will note when the skin color is off with circulation. So what, do we, what would we call that around that kid's mouth? Cyanosis, right? So when blood is not properly saturated with oxygen, it appears blue. So is this a circulation problem or is this a breathing problem? It's probably a breathing problem, right? Because they're not circulating oxygenated blood. And then changes in skin color can also result from chronic illness. Uh, there was a guy, I'll get you in a second, Daisy. When I was in college, there was a guy who showed up to all of our games, and I can't remember what his condition was, but he was blue. Like, that was just his normal skin tone was blue. Okay, so that's something you may have to ask. Is this a normal color for your skin? If it's not, we got to get involved. Yeah. It's probably super common, but if someone's like jaundiced or mm -hmm. something, would it make it hard to tell if they're circulating right because they're already like a weird color? 
I would assume they're not circul circulating well from the beginning. Because John to sing, I mean, they're gonna have that liver, liver failure is gonna back stuff up. You might see like JVD and different signs from that one as well. So yeah, I'd argue with John just they're not perfusing from the jump, essentially. Good question. Does everyone know what jaundicing is? When they turn yellow? Yeah, yeah. There was one gal, I'll never forget, took, pulled her out of a dark trailer middle of the night, and we got her into our rig. I flipped the lights on, and was like, well, son of a bitch, slap my ass and call me Marge, because I, I love you, homie. You know, like, she's yellow as yellow comes. Okay, so skin temperature. Normal skin will be warm to the touch. Abnormal skin temperature, hot, cool, cold, clammy, right? Those are all abnormal. We want them to be warm. You guys have felt warm skin before, that's what you're looking for. If it's too hot, what are we worried about? Fever. A fever, right? Versus if they're too cold or cool or cold, maybe we're worried about circulation on a different front, right? So moisture, dry skin's normal. Skin that is wet, moist, or excessively dry and hot suggests a problem. We want pink, warm, dry. We don't want pink, warm, too dry. We don't want diaphoretic. We don't want clammy, right? We want dry skin. Wet, moist, um, also typically not good, unless obviously the circumstances of the scenario present that way, right? Oh, they just got out of a pool. Well, that makes sense, right? Make it make sense. Um, yeah, so cap refill, evaluate to assess ability of the circulatory system to restore blood to the cap system. Press on the patient's fingernail, remove the pressure, and the nail bed should restore to its normal pink color in less than two seconds, two seconds or less, okay? So just like that, right? So that white, when it turns white, we call that blanching, and that's everywhere on the skin. If you push on anybody's skin and they get those like white marks, that's just blanching. But same thing, we want that to return to that pink color two seconds. So, with external bleeding and trauma patients, right, control it. Should occur before addressing airway or breathing. Because once again, we'll talk about it when we get to shock. But shock is, we think of it in three components, pumps, pipes, and fluids. Okay, so if we can't re, or if we don't have enough fluids in our body, and a fluid being blood in this circumstance, we cannot perfuse, right? Because blood is the vehicle that drops off oxygen and sugar and takes our waste away. So if the blood's not getting there because it's going to the outside world, we're gonna have a quick case of deadness, okay? So bleeding from a large vein characterizes a steady flow of blood. What color is venous bleeding? What, what kind of blood do, do, let me rephrase. Does, do veins carry oxygen? No, right? So it's not oxygenated blood. If it's not oxygenated, what color is it? It's what? It's like a dark red. Yeah, very dark, dark red. So veins are more of a steady flow of blood. It's just a consistent flow. Think about when someone's like cut their forehead and they just kept bleeding and bleeding and bleeding. That's venous blood, okay? Just steady flow out. Versus arterial blood. Do arteries carry oxygen or no? Yes. So what color are they? Bright red blood. Bright red blood is gonna be arterial bleeding. And then on top of it, you're gonna have spurting. So if, if I cut the artery in my wrist, every time my heart beats, there's gonna be a little bit of a spritz coming out. Okay, that's spurting. That's what they mean by spurting. Every heartbeat sends another little wave of blood out. Okay, and once again, bright red. Dark red, steady flow vein. Bright red, spurting artery. And then controlling external bleeding can be simple. Apply direct pressure. Most of your cuts will be taken care of with direct pressure. I will also teach you guys how to apply um, a pressure bandage as needed. And then if they continue to bleed even after pressure, we have to apply a tourniquet, okay? Um, or if it's an obvious arterial bleed. If it's an arterial bleed, no amount of pressure is gonna stop it, okay? They need that tourniquet. Um, now, trick question. If we put a tourniquet on, we've cinched it all the way down, it can't go any further, and they're still bleeding, what do we do? What was it? Second, second tourniquet. Yeah, we put a second tourniquet. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to bleeding control. I have a kind of a gripe against the education of tourniquets because every time they talk about the application of a second one, the verbiage is adjacent to. 
Is that top or bottom? We don't know, right? So we'll talk about it when we get there, okay? But I have lots of opinions that I'll let you in on. And facts, and facts too. I talk about facts from time to time. So the rapid exam. This one is kind of before we get into trauma, or excuse me, rather, before we get into the secondary assessment. We also call these blood sweeps, okay? So identify injuries that must be managed or protected before the patient is transported. Anywhere from 60 to 90 seconds. Now, this is not a systematic or a focused assessment. That's important to note because those are portions of our secondary assessment, okay? The rapid is not part of that. So more often than not, what I would do if I'm thinking trauma, I show up on scene, we'll say my patient's unconscious, I'm laying on the ground, there's bleeding, maybe. I'm gonna take my gloves, I'm gonna run my hands down from head to foot, just run my hands down their clothes. And then I'm gonna look at my hands. What do you think I'm looking for? Blood, right? We also call this the blood sweep. Because if you do that, and you check your hands and there's blood on it, they're obviously bleeding from somewhere. Now we gotta look, okay? But if you show up and you just do that and there's no blood on your hands, maybe you got a little bit more time, okay? So the rapid, once again, quick blood sweep, usually done right, right before the ABCs. Just run your hands down them real quick and then we can get into ABCs, right? The reason I put it there is because if we're talking a trauma and we gotta deal with circulation first, right? That big find is gonna be external bleeding. Okay. Questions on the rapid. Okay. So determining the priority of patient care and transport. So primary assessment assists in determining transport priority based on what we found during our checking of the ABCs is going to dictate, do we need to drive fast or do we need to drive slow? Do we have time to stay in play or do we got to treat with diesel a little bit? Okay. Now, high priority patients include those of any of the following. They're just gonna give a big long list. So, unresponsive, difficulty breathing, uncontrolled bleeding, altered level of consciousness, chest pain, pale skin, complicated childbirth, severe pain. Though if I'm being totally frank, I would not consider severe pain to be a high priority because no one has ever died of pain, right? Pain has never killed anybody. I say that as someone who gave pain meds and didn't wanna give it to seekers from time to time. And then the golden hour, okay? So the golden hour is the time from injury to definitive care. So they got hurt, they called 911. By the time an hour is up, they should be at the hospital. That is what we are searching for. At least, or excuse me, um, at longest we're there by an hour, okay? An hour should be the minimum time, or excuse me, maximum time it should take for you. Situ and that's obviously situationally dependent, right? If you're an hour and a half from the closest hospital, that kind of changes things, okay? Now, treatment of shock and traumatic injuries must occur during this golden hour time frame. An immediate transport is one of the keys to survival in patients who need immediate care that the EMT cannot provide. Um, this is a good time to burst some bubbles. For those of you who are getting into this field because you wanna be a hero and you wanna save lives, I hate to break it to you, we don't save lives, doctors do, okay? We put Band-Aids on and we give them time. We buy them time. Um, I learned that after a trauma surgeon told me, after I brought a guy and I was like, I saved this dude's life. He's like, no, you didn't, I did with my surgery. And I was like, well, I kinda helped, right? Um, it made me feel kinda bad in the moment, but it was, I thought on it and he was not wrong, right? Like, we don't fix a lot of the problems. We're a Band-Aid, okay? So, sometimes just the best treatment we can do is Load up, let's go, right? Just an example, that golden hour. Okay. So transport decisions should be made at this point. So based on their condition, how available is advanced care, how far do we have to go, and then whatever your protocols look like. Okay, so patient's condition, if they are something where the ABCs are under threat, we're gonna be driving faster, okay? Um, another thing, let's say we're I don't know, deep by the stage stop, past the stage stop, we're an hour and a half from the hospital. Okay, that might be a moment, do we consider, hey, let's call a helicopter, right? Let's save some time, okay? Because they're still not stable and it's gonna take me way longer to get there than if they were to fly out and then fly back, okay? 
Um, and that same thing falls under distance of transport, right? If it's, it's gonna be, tr uh, excuse me, if it's gonna be easier for someone else to get there or faster for someone else to get there, utilize that resource. Questions so far? Yeah, Jay. I just wondering, when you call for ALS but you have to let them go, are these paramedics, is the ambulance stopping while paramedic parks gets jumps in the back and you go? No, you're not doing like the you're not doing like the fast and the furious like hop on the freeway stuff. Uh, yeah, someone will pull over. So basically what usually will happen, I'm assuming I'm always been ALS, so I haven't had to do this, but you're gonna call them, hey, we are taking this road we have this route to the hospital planned where are you guys at they'll tell you and then you'd be like okay why don't we meet at this corner and then you'll pull into that corner one of them will hop out or both of them will hop out and then you'll just drive in your ambulance you're not swapping patients they're just going to hop into your ambulance someone else will drive their ambulance to the hospital so it's pretty seamless usually within 30 seconds or so Okay, so history taking provides detail about the chief complaint of the patient's signs and symptoms. Getting a history can, can help. Uh, remember I said you get to play detective, right? So getting a good history solves your mystery a lot of the time. Rhyme, intentional. Um, a lot of times it will help, right? If someone's having a heart attack and they, you talk to them, like, have you ever had one of these before? And they're like, yeah, I've had four of them. Well, I'm probably thinking it's happening again, right? If it's happened before, especially something serious, it can always happen again, okay? So, provides detail about the, blah, blah, blah. Includes demographic information, so date of incident, age, gender, race, medical history, current health status. Um, on that list, I really didn't care much to notate current health status because if they're calling an ambulance, I'd say their health status is probably pretty poor, right? For the most part, they're calling us, they need help health-wise. So investigate the chief complaint, make introductions, make the patient feel comfortable, say their name, introduce yourself, okay? Try to be personable, build good rapport, um, and then obtain permission to treat, right? We want that expressed consent, hopefully. Uh, ask a few simple and direct questions, refer to the patient as Mr., Miss, Mrs., um, using their last name. I will tell you that um, I called a lot of women ma'am, and they don't like it. Uh, they don't like it. So uh, if you miss whatever their last name is, the only caveat is if they're a Southern woman, you say miss in their first name and they will be eating out of your hand by the end of that day, I promise you. Um, they love it for whatever reason, but it works. I didn't believe it until I tried it and it works. And then ask open-ended questions. Can someone give me an example of an open-ended question? What seems to be bothering you today? Yeah, exactly. What seems to be bothering you? We give them a chance to respond, right? So open-ended questions allow for them to give us all of the details of the world, right? Versus a closed question, we're asking them like yes and no questions. We're trying to dictate the response as one of two things. Okay, so ask them open questions or open-ended questions. Try and get a response out of them. That can be difficult from time to time. I don't know if you guys know anybody who's a talker in your life, but you ask them an open-ended question, they're gonna eat up 15 minutes of your time. You will run into those patients as well, okay? That's gonna be another level of difficulty trying to get them to divert away from giving so much information, right? We're looking for what we're looking for. At a certain point, we gotta keep moving forward. So you'll have to tackle that as it comes. Now, if the patient is unresponsive, we show up, they are not there. Not, not as in not there, but they're Lights off, nobody's home. Patient information are, and clues about the incident can be obtained from family members, right, or bystanders, uh, which all three of these things are the same thing. Person who may have witnessed the situation, right, but if we're talking, you know, hypoglycemic situation, someone's blood sugar got low, maybe ask their spouse, when's the last time they ate anything, or when did they take their medication last, right? Asking bystanders on the scene of an accident, what happened? Can you tell me which car was going which direction? Let's figure this out. Okay, uh, you can also look at their medical alert jewelry if they have it. Um, nowadays, like I said, check their phones if they filled out their health tab. Uh, we use that a lot, okay? So their, their medical ID. And then other patient medical history documentation. If you guys go to facilities, um, oftentimes they're required to have a face sheet for you. Not every, oftentimes, every time they're required to have a face sheet for you. This face sheet essentially has their demographics, all of their complaints, their history, their allergies, all the stuff on it. Um, and sometimes these packets can be pretty dense. There are people who take lots and lots of medications. Okay, so you're gonna have to get pretty familiar with thumbing through those, looking for information. 
especially if we're talking to somebody who maybe has dementia, Alzheimer's, and they are not really aware of what their health care is anymore, right? They know they take pills, they just don't know why, okay? You might have to do some digging through their history. Okay, and then the next mnemonic, OPQRST. You're gonna need to commit this one to memory also. So OPQRST, we use this for when people are in pain, okay? It's a good identifier for pain. Now, if I'm being totally transparent, it's built perfectly for chest pain in particular, but that said, anytime there's pain, you're gonna use OPQRST. So O, onset. What were you doing when this started, okay? What were you doing when this started? Now, you may notice that onset, the O is pretty simple, or excuse me, uh, actually, just kidding, we're not there yet. Have we covered sample yet? No, I don't think so. I think we covered it in this. I digress. For right now, onset, what were you doing when this started? Provocation or palliation? Does that pain move anywhere? Or excuse me, don't write that down. Does anything make it better or worse? I apologize. Does anything make this pain better or worse? What were you doing? Anything make the pain better or worse? So say they're having chest pain. If you sit down, does that make your pain go away? Versus walking, does that make the pain worse? Quality, can you describe it to me? Okay, so sharp, dull, achy, pressure. Um, I will say when it comes to quality, be careful. Uh, medics and EMTs are very good at getting the answers we want. So if you're going to be providing them with options, make sure you give them a few. Don't just say, what's this pain feel like, sharp or dull? And then say they're like, well, it's pressure, but I'll go with sharp, right? We don't want that. Give them, give them options if you're gonna provide options. Um, okay, I also used to ask that question too of like, uh, if you were to do it to me, what would you do? Right, if you were to stab me, sit on me, whatever, right? Uh, region slash radiation, is the pain moving anywhere? Pretty commonly, you guys may know this, with heart attacks, it's common in men for them to get like left-sided neck pain, left-sided arm pain. That's a pretty stereotypical presentation, but that's radiating pain. It's pain that's moving away from the original source, okay? Uh, severity, zero to 10, 10 being the worst pain you have ever felt. What would you say you're at right now number-wise? You'll also find that we have the little faces next to those. So if you're unsure, look at the face and confirm it with their face, okay? Um, personally, I'm not a big fan of this question. Reason being is pain is really subjective, right? Like my six might not be your six, your 10 might not be my 10, right? Pain is very subjective. Um, I had a call one time where I was working with a newer guy and there was a gentleman who complained of abdominal pain. We walk in, he's sitting on his bed and he's looking at me just like you guys are now. No distress in his eyes. So the newer medic walks up and says, zero to 10, 10 being you're on fire. What would you say your pain's at right now? And he looked at us and thought about it and was like, mm, probably a nine. It's like a nine compared to fire, right? You do really good in fire. Um, I don't like it. I just don't like it. It's too subjective. That said, it is something you may be needed to ask or you need, may need to ask, okay? Um, a lot of times that finding is kind of here or there, okay? And then time, when did this start? So usually in OPQRST, the O and the T kind of get crisscrossed in people's minds. Onset is what were you doing? Time is when did this start, okay? And this helps us identify what are called pertinent negatives. Sometimes it's a good thing that our findings are negative, right? If I do a stroke assessment on somebody and they're not having a stroke, that's a pertinent negative, right? That's a good finding that's, oh, this is negative. Well, I know it's not a stroke now, right? We can scratch that, clear that from the table. Or even like if I was to say, I show up to a chest pain patient and then I actually squeeze on their chest. And I'm like, does it make it better or worse as I'm squeezing on your chest? And they say, oh, that's way worse when you squeeze on it. Do you think it's a heart problem or a chest problem, right? So that's where you can start finding that. If I squeeze in and say, oh, that hurts worse, I'm thinking chest wall. I don't think it's cardiac anymore. I can clear that off the table. That's a pertinent negative. See how that works? You can kind of clarify things by finding things that it's not for sure. You can work your way into what it could be. Okay, so then the next mnemonic. This is another one you're gonna need to remember. 
sample. So this is gonna be our biggest history finding mnemonic. You're gonna use this with almost every single patient you see. The only ones I can think that might not be as pertinent would be your, uh, your trauma patients, right? Because trauma is not usually the result of lots of things over time. It's a incident in the moment, right? Now, sample, the S stands for signs and symptoms. Now, realistically, for you guys, when you get out there, you're gonna be able to see the signs and symptoms. So do you think you're gonna need to ask about it? Maybe not, maybe, right? Depending if we can't see everything, but they're gonna tell you pretty quick what's going on with them, okay? So a lot of times you guys are gonna be doing the ample history. You probably don't need to ask signs and symptoms because they're things you're already seen or already have been made aware of, okay? The A stands for allergies and that's encompassing, okay? We're looking for food, we're looking for medications or any allergy you have, okay? Now, one thing you, sh you should ask, depending on the circumstances, is what happens when you have that allergic reaction? Because some people you'll find it's not really an allergic reaction. Um, an example would be like uh, pain medications. Has anyone ever had pain meds in here before for like a surgery or procedure or whatever? Do they make you feel nauseous and vomit with them? Yeah, I've had people say, I'm allergic to morphine. Well, what happens? And I start throwing up and I get nauseous. That's a side effect of the medication. That's a normal thing, right? So you can sometimes find those, but for the most part, allergies we're looking all, all encompassing. Can someone tell me a call type where allergies might be important to note? Hmm? I heard talking. Anaphylaxis, right? Someone's having an anaphylactic allergic reaction, that's pretty important, right? Or if we're giving a medication, say you're giving aspirin, they're allergic to aspirin, should we give it to them? Probably not, right? So you see how this starts playing a role in our care? The P, or excuse me, skipping one, the M, medications. What medications do you take? Oftentimes, if you're getting a list, you're gonna go through the list. This tends to be a job that I've seen, in my experience, is a lot of fire captain jobs, where they'll basically walk in, they have their chart started, they'll go and find all the medications, they'll put the list in, because sometimes they'll walk out with like a basket of meds and be like, these are the meds, and I'll say, cool, put them in the computer, and then they, ugh, as they type everything in, okay? But you gotta find these meds. They're worth noting, because you have all of the world's information in a little black brick in your pocket, right? If you don't know what's going on with the patient, but you look at their medication list and you start Googling what their meds do, you might be able to find out what's going on with your patient, right? Um, same thing kind of flip-flops, like if in their medical history, which the P stands for pertinent medical history, right? Pertinent being important. But say they don't know what meds they take, but they know they have high blood pressure. Well, then we can start asking them high blood pressure medications. Or let's say they know what meds they take, but they don't remember for why. We can do some Googling and maybe, okay, well, they take lisinopril for blood pressure, right? That would make sense. So S, signs and symptoms, A, allergies, M, medications, P, pertinent past medical history. The L, last oral intake. That's where we're looking for it. What food, what uh, liquids have you consumed? Uh, what was the last time you ate or drank anything, essentially, summarized. Can someone tell me a call where that might be important or a call type? Food poisoning. Food poisoning, maybe. What, what, everyone over there? Diabetes. Diabetes, that's a big one for hypoglycemia, right? When's the last time you ate anything? Is your blood sugar low because you didn't eat or is your blood sugar low because you took too much medications without eating, right? Can figure that out. And then events leading up to the injury slash illness. What happens to cause this? Now you may notice that the E is kind of like the O in OPQRST. It's okay. You get your answer twice or maybe you skip that question. You already know, right? What were the events leading up? Well, I just told you with what I was doing before this started, right, with my onset. So you can kind of double down, right? You can, you can two bird, one stone, a lot of questions between sample and OPQRST. Any questions on these mnemonics at all? Okay, moving on. So critical thinking in assessment. So there's three phases, gathering, evaluating, synthesizing, okay? So gathering is gonna be seeking our facts. What is all the information I see in front of me? Okay, let's just be a sponge and absorb as much of that as we can. 
From there, let's look at the information and evaluate what does this information mean. Okay, so considering what the information means and then synthesizing, putting the information together to plan scene management and patient care. So the way I think of this, the way I think of the gathering, evaluating, synthesizing, everything from our vital signs to our assessment is all gonna be included under those three steps. I think of them all as puzzle pieces. When you do a puzzle, you know, you flip all your pieces, you put your corners in your corners, you get the, the sides lined up, right? Get as many as these puzzle pieces flipped over and in the right places as you can. So that way, when we find the piece of information that's like, oh, that's the critical one, we can put it in there and see where it clicks together. Okay, because nothing's worse than starting a puzzle, flipping all your pieces, getting most of it done to realize you're missing three or four pieces. Right? Get as much of this information as you possibly can. Okay, even if it's stuff that doesn't make sense in the moment, doesn't feel pertinent in the moment, at least you can say you checked it and it's normal, right? Things like a blood sugar. Someone doesn't have a history of diabetes, they got in a car wreck, but we're not sure, they seem a little bit off, let's just get a blood sugar, right? Worst case scenario is that it's normal and we can move on, we know it's normal. Okay, but gather the facts that you can gather and then give yourself the best odds at putting the pieces together. Okay, as many as you can. Uh, history and sensitive topics, so alcohol and drugs. So signs may be confusing, hidden, or disguised, right? Drugs can look like a, a several different conditions, okay? Patient may deny having any problems. The history gathered may be unreliable, right? If someone's an alcoholic and we're asking them for their medical history, we don't always know if we can trust them, right? Just based on what they're presenting us with. Um, I'm sure you've got experience with them not telling the truth and the whole truth, right? But alcohol and drugs can make things difficult, okay? And it can also make it tougher to identify the history and the information you're gathering. All you can do is take it at face value and dig deeper and see if you can find anything different yourself, okay? Um, now, regardless, don't judge the patient. Try your best to not judge the patient, right? Give everyone the same dignity and respect that you would like. I would caveat that with, you know, don't give them the respect if they don't give you the same, right? You don't have to respect everyone. Go into it as the bigger person, okay? And try to maintain being the bigger person, but I'll tell you people are push your buttons, okay? They might, might get you from, away from that. And then always be professional in your approach, okay? Once again, give them the dignity and respect. Be a professional, this is your job, right? Talk to them like people. Um, physical abuse or violence, so report all physical abuse or domestic violence to the appropriate authorities, follow your protocols. Now this is where the liability for us starts to set in a little bit. Do not accuse, instead immediately involve law enforcement. Okay, this is not our job. We do not have a lot of legal jurisdiction. Frankly, we don't have any real legal jurisdiction. Okay, um, but just don't make accusations. Leave that to law enforcement. Keep strong suspicions, be ready to protect your patient as needed, but we report it to doctors and PD, okay? Um, keep your cool. Uh, there was something else. Ah, it's gone. It'll be back eventually. Okay, nope. Sexual history. Uh, consider all female patients of childbearing age who report lower abdominal pain to be pregnant. It's been missed a lot, that's why. More so, there's a type of pregnancy ectopic pregnancies are what they're called that are missed a lot and those are genuine life threats to uh, women pregnant women okay uh, so you need to start building this kind of foundation of guesses right if we're showing up to a situation and it's lower general abdominal pain you're going to have to have a list of five things in your head that you think it could possibly be right pregnancy is going to be on the top of that list for women now, ask about their last menstrual cycle. You're gonna to have to inquire about urinary symptoms with male patients. Um, you might have to ask about STDs with people, okay? You're gonna to have to have pretty uncomfortable conversations with folks. Now, remember, we're the professionals. We're the ones who can handle having these conversations. They might be uncomfortable, but we have to try and make them as comfortable as we can so that they can give us the information we need to know, okay? Oh, um, where did it go? Do not accuse, instead immediately involve law enforcement. Another thing on that same note, when it comes to your charting, 
and I'll, you'll, I'll get on this high horse again later. When it comes to charting, if there's a potential rape victim, we do never, or we never ever write the word rape in our charts. Okay, it's sexual assault. Got that? I think I've talked about that in here before. Have I not? Yes, no, no? Okay, yeah. If there's a potential rape victim, it's sexual assault. Because if we write the word rape, rape is a legal term, okay? The, and I promise you, one of the first questions they're gonna ask is, did you see them get raped? Well, no. How do you know it's a rape, right? Can you verify it? It's the way the law works, right? It's a little bit backwards. So sexual assault, because we don't want to um, basically screw the defendant out of whatever justice they deserve from this, right? So sexual assault, not rape. That's, that was what was in my head. Okay. Um, another demographic of folk, gotta remember we're in the United States. We're like real good at teen pregnancy. We have like three TV shows about it, right? You're gonna have to have uncomfortable conversations from time to time with 15, 16 year old girls. Okay, think about the moment. Do you think they're gonna talk about their sexual history in front of their parents? No, right? So you're gonna have to think around that situation. For me, if I could get them to the back of the ambulance, I know that's a safe space. I would have my partner in there with me. Let's have an open and honest conversation. If they were not willing to leave the house, but they wanted a room, I'd say, okay, let's get the parents out. I'd have them say, this is the room. I'd be in there talking to the patient. I would have my partner standing right here with the door open, right? That way, if something does go sideways, they can immediately get in there and probably defend you legally also if there's accusations of you doing something you weren't doing, okay? Protect yourself, CYA stuff, cover your Okay, some more special challenges, challenges, challenges. Silence, patient, okay? Um, be very, very patient. These people, there's not everyone's gonna wanna talk to you and not everyone's gonna talk to you. It's your job to try and make them talk to you, okay? It's not up to you to decide for them to talk, right? So with these ones, if you start running into the silent type, the strong silent, use closed-ended questions that require simple yes or no answers, okay? If you can even get it where they can nod or shake their head, right? That's still communicating. That's still a good way to get through it. Now, one thing to consider is the silence due to their, con their condition, right? Are they having a stroke where they can't talk? Are right? there some sort of speech thing going on? Um, or is this a situation where we're picking up a guy who's probably gonna go to jail and he doesn't wanna talk, right? In which case, gotta do your best, try to get him talking as best you can, okay? Now, flip side of that coin, if they're overly talkative, now, so here's some reasons, right? Excessive caffeine consumption, nervousness, ingestion of uppers such as cocaine, crack, methamphetamine, and then underlying psychological issues, right? Mental health issues could play a role in that too. Things like ADHD, schizophrenia, ADD, right? Those are all things where they can be all over the board talking really rapidly. My best advice for these is just stay patient. These ones are more frustrating to me than the silent type. At least the silent type I know is like, oh, you just don't want to talk to me, I tried. Right, these ones, it can be tough because they're gonna talk your ear off and you're trying to ask several different questions. Okay, so don't be afraid to interrupt them politely, right? Use tact, but interrupt them as needed. Be like, sorry, I gotta ask you another question and then ask them that question. Listen until you have the information you want and then if you have to interrupt them again, same thing, right? Keep that cycle going, but you're gonna have to find a way to break that cycle of speech for them Otherwise, we're just not gonna have the stuff done we need to have done. And sometimes being totally transparent with them works too. Listen, I need to go through these questions. I just need you to answer the next few for me, okay? And usually they're like, okay, cool. And then they'll go into their story again, but still things worth considering. Um, also, just unrelated to a lot of this, but methamphetamine, in my experience, they are pretty forthcoming with what they're doing. So if someone's on meth, ask them, are you on meth? And they say, oh yeah, they'll tell you. They're pretty, pretty quick on that draw. It's weird. Uh, and so let's say multiple symptoms. We show up, did the car crash cause the heart attack or vice versa, right? They have multiple symptoms going on at the same time. You need to prioritize the patient's complaint as you would in triage, okay? So let's look at the patient. Out of these three complaints, which one of these things is going to kill the patient fastest? Once we find what's gonna kill them fastest, that's usually where you're gonna start, okay? Let's stop the life threats early. We can always deal with the little things in a little bit, right? Um, like say we show up on scene for somebody who got a big cut on their neck. They also broke their wrist, right? We get them in the back. 
they got multiple complaints going on, one of them is going to kill them a lot quicker, right? Let's get pressure on the neck and we can always splint while we're driving, okay? You're going to have to prioritize. And then sometimes you're going to have patients where it's airway is going downhill, breathing is going downhill, circulation is going downhill. At a certain point, you just got to pick something and go, okay? If they're all deemed life threats, pick something, keep going forward, okay? And you can always do it in the ABC order as well just to kind of keep things organized in your head. Uh, so anxiety, some anxious patients show signs of psychological shock. So pallor, what does pallor mean? It's a skin sign. Most, most of the word you're thinking is actually already spelled out there. Pale, pallor is pale. Yeah, so if they're pale, diaphoretic, meaning they're sweating and sweating and sweating, right? For no reason. Uh, short of breath, numbness in the hands, feet, dizziness or lightheadedness, loss of consciousness. These people can be difficult. Um, does anyone ever have experience talking somebody out of an anxiety attack? That is something that you're going to be doing a lot, okay? How can you use your presence as a calming agent? That's not the right word. But, but how can we help calm down this situation? Because if they're going to be up at 10, and then we rise up to the level of 10 with them, this whole call is gonna get, uh, get chaotic, you're gonna miss stuff, okay? Cool, calm, collected, try to talk these people down, okay? Try to manage it as best you can. Um, anger, hostility, friends, family, or bystanders may direct their anger and rage at you. That happens from time to time. I've had a few of those where um, after a cardiac arrest, grandma and grandpa married for 55 years, one of them died, the whole family shows up at the door and they are mad for what, I mean, they're mad at the situation, but they're gonna come to you first because you're the one responsible for it, right? In their head, because you weren't able to do enough, okay? It can be frustrating. This is gonna be one, don't forget, you can always utilize your resources, right? PD, utilize fire, utilize your ambulance crews, keep people around you if things are starting to get a little hairy, strengthen numbers, okay? But calm, reassuring, gentle, and that the scene is not safe or secure, get it secured. When, it, when they say get it secured, it's either you guys leave the scene or you hit your little orange panic button, okay? Send every cop in the five mile radius to you. Uh, intoxication, do not put an intoxicated patient in a position where he or she feels threatened, right? Because violence tends to follow intoxication. So potential for violence, physical confrontation is high. And then remember, alcohol doles the, patient, the patient's senses. So they might not be aware of the injuries they're dealing with, okay? Um, they're not, they can't feel it, they're intoxicated. I recently read a story about a guy who was super drunk, got punched in the face, and his friend's like, you need to go to the hospital. And he's like, nah, I'm fine. I'm fine, they'd been drinking, they'd been drinking, and they finally looked in the mirror when the medic showed up and a quarter of his face was hanging down over here, right? But he was so drunk he couldn't feel it. So these can be difficult. You're gonna have to do a little bit more digging from time to time. Maybe get a hands-on uh, actual palpation on them. Okay, make sure you're not missing stuff. Uh, crying, a patient who cries may be sad in pain or emotionally overwhelmed. Remain calm, be patient, reassuring, and confident and then maintain a soft voice. You'll be dealing with crying in all sorts of spectrums, whether pain, sad, just having a bad day and stuff's been building up on them. I mean, I was dispatched one time for a lady who could not stop crying. And when I got there, she was not crying with the firefighter, saw me start crying again. So I took that real personally. Um, but she just wouldn't stop crying. That was her complaint. And at the end of the day, do I think that deemed an ambulance? No. But am I someone who can say no? Also no, so here we are, right? So just do your best to manage it. Be calm, confident, okay? Try and keep a soft voice and be reassuring. Depression, among the leading causes of disability worldwide. And symptoms include sadness, hopelessness, restlessness, irritability, sleeping and eating disorders, decreased energy level. Be a good listener. Um, just to kind of get this out of the way, when we talk about depression, someone having depression, the emotion of to be depressed is normal. That is a human emotion, it is normal. When we talk about depression, it's when it becomes a chronic thing. Like six, seven, eight months of every year you're dealing with this depression. That's a chronic thing, okay? These people you're gonna have to listen to. Um, and these are the people that your words can have a little bit more weight than you, I think you intend them to have. 
Um, I have a family member who, who attempted a suicide a few years back, and she doesn't really talk about the day too much. She doesn't remember a whole lot, but the one thing she does talk about is that she remembers how the paramedics treated her, okay? And she had been in a pretty bad cycle of depression at that point. So this is where we can actually make those differences, right? Sometimes just putting, you know, listening to someone, putting a hand on the shoulder, holding someone's hand as needed is all they really need, okay? So don't shy away from human moments. I really, I challenge you for that. Don't shy away from the human moments because if you can make someone's day better just a little bit, do it, right? It's not that hard, especially if we're dealing with people potentially dealing with the worst day of their life, what's holding someone hand, someone's hand if they really need it, okay? Um, confusing behavior or history. So conditions such as hypoxia, stroke, diabetes, trauma, meds, other drugs can alter their explanations of events. Remember, altered mental status. If they're not sure what's going on, we gotta do some more digging, okay? Uh, and then older people, dementia, delirium, Alzheimer's, all potential, okay? And we'll go, into tra we'll go into detail on each one of these conditions later. These are just all potential confusing behavior explanations, okay? Uh, uh, lig limited cognitive abilities. So keep your questions simple, limit the use of medical terms. When we're talking to patients in general, I would caution you with using medical jargon unless there's someone in the medical field, okay? Use plain speech, make sure they're in tune with their own healthcare, okay? Uh, be alert for partial answers, keep asking questions. And then when it comes to cognitive ability, de uh, developmental disabilities, rely on the presence of family, caregivers, and friends to supply answers. Especially if there's somebody with a developmental disability, their parents are gonna be really in the know about what's going on with them. Uh, there's one kid in Meridian I used to see a lot. He's got autism and he sees us from time to time. But his parents were great. I could ask his parents any of the questions and they knew exactly, oh no, that's not normal for this phase of this. Oh, I, he's starting to come too. This is a normal presentation, right? They can give you that information. So rely heavily on the people that know your patients if you have that opportunity, okay? Especially if we're talking children, right? Uh, cultural challenges, once again, medical language, be careful with it. Now, patients may prefer to speak with healthcare providers of the same gender. In my experience in this area, it has been a lot of Middle Eastern folks. They do not like um, male providers working on the female people of their culture, okay? Now, that's not always the case, right? We don't always draw the straw where we are a male-female crew. So if you're a double male or double female or whatever the split is and you have to line up genders, do your best, okay? Because that's, they don't really have a choice. The people that show up are the ones that show up, okay? Um, but do your best. Just try and talk through, explain to them, okay? Um, another thing that you might run into is language stuff, right? Which I think the next slide is, nope. Uh, but language stuff. A lot of times these refugees will have some sort of point of contact that speaks English as well. So they'll often be on the speaker phone when you walk in, utilize that resource. I used to leave them on speaker the whole time and I would talk to the phone and they would kind of translate for everybody, okay? Um, you can also gain assistance of patients, friends or family members. Uh, kids are big ones, especially if there's gonna be a language barrier. If the child is, you know, speaks the, obviously their native tongue and then English, Utilize them as best you can, okay? They're gonna be the best mediator for you. And then enlist the help of healthcare providers of the same culture or background, if possible, if possible. Um, one thing I do want to say though, if they speak a different language as we're going into the hospital, notify the hospital. They will have a translator on deck for them. You're gonna to wanna to know the language as well. So you're gonna to have to try and muddy through that conversation as best you can. Okay, usually they can tell you the language pretty quick though. Um, hearing problems. Ask questions slow and clear. You can use a stethoscope to function as a hearing aid. I've never tried that. I've heard it works, but I've never tried it. Giving them your stethoscope and just talking into it. Um, learn simple sign language if you want, and then pencil paper. So in my experience with the hearing impaired, one, if they have hearing aids, take the time to get them and put them in their ears, okay? Even if you have to physically put them in their ears. I'm a big proponent of making my own life easier and that will make your life easier because then you're not screaming at an old lady um, who can't hear you, okay? And then pen and paper, I used to, uh, I had a notebook that I would write in. I also had chalkboards, there was whiteboards, but I did from time to time I'd communicate back and forth with someone just written because it was an older gal who just could not hear at all. Um, 
but you're gonna have to think around the box, get creative, right? If it's someone who's maybe younger and they have a hearing disability, maybe we start typing, right? Type to text in your phone if you have to, right? But some sort of back and forth. Language barriers, I kind of touched into this one, but find an interpreter if possible. Like I said, more often than not, they have a point of contact in this area and make sure you notify the hospital that they're gonna have whatever language, okay? Um, make sure, or so if not determined if the patient understands who you are, keep questions straightforward and brief, and then be aware of the language diversity in your community, or hand gestures too. But in our community, right, we have lots of different folks here. We have Bosnian refugees, we have Croatian, we have um, African refugees, Middle Eastern refugees in this area. So the languages can be broad, okay? Um, Google Translate is going to be a, one of your best friends from time to time. Um, yeah. One time my wife ran a call on this guy who spoke Spanish only. My wife does not speak a lick of Spanish. And he kept saying corazón, which means heart, he kept saying it over and over and over. So they thought he was having chest pain when they got to the hospital in front of a translator. He said, oh no, his heart hurts because he misses his family, right? So they, they basically kidnapped this guy and took him to a hospital just to be like, I'm sad, I miss everybody. Um, so that's where it kind of gets important, right? Start making sure you're trying to pay attention to it. That way you're not taking everyone to the hospital needlessly, okay? Uh, visual impairment, identify yourself verbally when you enter the house, return any items that have been moved to their previous positions. Okay, we move coffee tables a lot to make space, put them back, um, and explain to the patient what's happening each step of your assessment, right? Keep them in the loop. If we're gonna be walking somewhere, maybe have them put their hand on your shoulder or link arms, right? And if you're guiding someone, for the love of God, people do not walk blind people into stuff. It's a real bad look, okay? Um, there's one more thing. Oh, no. The second bullet always reminds me of this video I saw of a blind pug that they moved the couch in their house, so he went to jump on the couch, and yeah, he met the wall really quick, and it just it tickles me a little bit, so I just, I imagined a blind person doing that, and I wanted to laugh, so here we are. Okay, so moving on. Any questions about any of this stuff so far? I know it feels like a lot of redundancy stuff. I, this is the things I don't love either, but we gotta get through it. Okay, so moving into the secondary assessment. Okay, now the secondary assessment, you have options with it. It can be performed on scene, it can be performed in the back of an ambulance on the way to a hospital, or it can be, be performed not at all. It really just depends on the circumstance. Okay, when we're talking about the secondary assessment, we're talking about a hands-on assessment. If I get my hands on the patient and palpate, what am I gonna find? Okay, now there's two types for you guys. There's a systematic head to toe, and there's a focused assessment. I'm gonna show you guys a systematic head to toe a little later. I don't wanna muddy the water with it right now, okay? But when we get to trauma, I will show you that, okay? Now, so when we talk about systematic head to toe versus focused, uh, I'm going to back. Uh, actually, yeah, when we talk about systematic head to toe versus focus, the systematic, so let's say we show up to a situation, person found down unresponsive, maybe they got a little blood. We don't necessarily know what happened, right? So from there, once we get them into an ambulance or somewhere where we can cut clothes off and not be, you know, de dignifying this person in public, but anywhere we can cut clothes off, let's cut the clothes off and then let's feel every single portion, starting at the head, working our way down. Do we notice anything broken? Okay, versus let's say we show up to a conscious person who's like, I fell down and my arm is in the lightning bolt shape. But they're like, I didn't lose consciousness, didn't hit my head, my only complaint is my arm, right? That might be a, a moment we can take a focused assessment, right? Like, okay, I don't need to look at the whole body, I can just zone in on just that arm there, or leg or whatever it is in your imagination there. So how and what to assess. So we will, ins we will be assessing them with three different methods. Inspection, palpation, auscultation. So inspection, you're gonna be looking at them, right? Do I see anything that's off? Like, do I see bleeding? Do I see a deformed arm? Do I see um, any sort of deformity, right? Bruising, bleeding, all sorts of things. We're gonna put, uh, put hands on them. We're gonna palpate. So touch or feel the patient for abnormalities. And then we're gonna auscultate, okay? Or listen. So inspection is with our eyes, palpation is with our hands, auscultates with our ears, okay? And when we auscultate, we use the stethoscope. We don't put our ears up to people's body, okay? It's just weird. 
Um, and so then we will use the mnemonic DCAP BTLS. This is another one you're going to have to commit to memory. So, I don't know. Okay. So the D in DCAP BTLS stands for deformity. Okay. Do we see any deformities? It's like that arm in a lightning bolt or an ankle making a right turn it shouldn't be making. Okay. The next one stands for contusions slash crepitus. Okay, and I'll spell out crepitus here. Crepitus. Okay, crepitus. Has anybody ever broken a bone in here? Has anyone ever broken like a finger or a toe? You know that crunching feeling that you feel? That's crepitus. If you were to feel those bone ends kind of rubbing up against each other and kind of scraping, that's what you're feeling. So, uh, and then what's a contusion? Can someone tell me what a contusion is? What? It's a bruise. Yeah, contusion is just a bruise. Um, the A stands for abrasions. A B R A S I O N. Abrasion. An abrasion is like road rash, right? They get a scrape on their arm. It's not bleeding, bleeding, but they just took that layer of skin. P stands for puncture slash penetrations. The B stands for burns. The T stands for tenderness. The L stands for lacerations. And the S stands for swelling. So deformities, confusions, cre or excuse me, contusion, crepitus, abrasions, puncture slash penetration, burns, tenderness, lacerations, swelling. Okay, these are all the different things we are looking for in our trauma or in our traumatic systematic head to toe. Okay, when we're feeling down the body, we're going to be inspecting, auscultating, and palpating for these things. Okay, and once again, crepitus is the crunchy bone. So if they had a broken bone and I was doing this, I could feel those bone ends crunching against each other. That's crepitus. Okay, so systematically assess the patient. Now the goal is to identify hidden injuries or hidden causes missed during the 60 to 90 second exam Okay, uh, during primary assessment. So it's not the rapid sweep. Remember that rapid, or that rapid exam is not a systematic head to toe. It is not a focused exam. Okay, it's that quick blood sweep to see if we find anything fast. The systematic head to toe is if during the primary assessment, we don't think we got everything, we, we're missing information, you're gonna have to start palpating. In situations where the patient is unconscious, unresponsive, especially trauma, you're going to be getting them, as we lovingly refer to as, trauma naked, okay? You need to cut all of their clothes off. You can cover them with a blanket, keep them modest, or a towel, keep them modest, but we gotta cut all the clothes so we can inspect, right? Also, it gives us a better angle at looking at things when we're palpating, making sure we're not missing anything, okay? We're almost done, guys. So the focused assessment performed on patients who have sustained non-significant mechanisms or is a, responsive, is a responsive patient, okay? Typically based on their chief complaint. And the goal is to focus your attention on the body part or systems affected by the priority problems, okay? So remember with the systematic head to toe versus the focused, systematic head to toe, we're not sure what started the head, work our way to the toe. If it's a focused assessment, they have a broken arm, let's lock in on that broken arm. Or let's say it's in a medical situation, they're alert, maybe they have, they're having an asthma attack, right? Maybe we gotta dive into the respiratory system to deal with their breathing. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, respiratory system stuff, expose the patient's chest, look for signs of airway obstruction, look for symmetry, we're looking for that bilateral chest rise and fall, okay? Listen to breath sounds, measure the respiratory rate, look for retractions, increased work of breathing, right? Anything that in your gut says normal people wouldn't be breathing like this, okay, we've got to look into it. Uh, do I need to talk about the rates for respiratory? 12 to 20, 
We're gonna count for a minute total, right? However you get to a minute, however you get to a minute, but you gotta do the math. So if it's 30 seconds multiplied by two, 15 times four, six times 10, right? Do your math to get an accurate count. If you're really worried about their respiratory rate and you're like, it's moving at a rate that I can't quite clock, count for the full minute, okay? Just count for the full minute, you'll have a far more accurate number, okay? Uh, regular, do I need to go over regular versus irregular? Any comments, concerns on that? If you got concerns, voice them. I don't mind stopping and slowing down. Okay. Uh, quality, I will talk about. So normal breathing is silent. Do you hear everyone in here breathing right now? Right. Normal breathing is silent. So if we're hearing abnormal sounds, snoring, gurgling, uh, maybe wheezing, right? Strider, we'll talk about that one later. Those are all signs that there's a respiratory problem going on. We have to get involved. We have to start oxygenating this patient, okay? Uh, the depth of breathing, so the amount of air the patient exchanges depends on the rate in tidal volume, right? This is where tidal volume makes a difference. We want people to take that nice deep breath so they have a good minute volume, okay? And then breath sounds. We will go over the breath sounds in a little more depth later but we will auscultate, we will be using our stethoscopes to listen to their lungs, listen to the chest, okay? How do their lungs sound? You'll come to find, when we talk about them later, that lung sounds can be a pretty good identifier for potential conditions going on with the patient, okay? I really like this picture because that guy's mean mugging so hard on the left picture. But when we auscultate, listen to the back, okay? Listening to the back is gonna give you the best sound. Um, frankly, if you're not listening to the back, more than likely you're missing something. Now, I'm not gonna front with you. I've definitely listened to people on their chest. That's fine too. I'm just saying the quality of sound will be better on their back. So if you can, get to their back, okay? And then what are we listening for? Normal breath sounds, snoring breath sounds, wheezing, crackles, ronchi, and strider. So let's talk about these a little bit here. Wheezing. Can someone tell me the condition associated with wheezing typically? Asthma. Asthma, yeah. So when we talk about wheezing, we're talking about bronchospasming, okay? Because asthma is bronchospasming. So if we talk about our bronchi, right, our trachea goes down, splits to our left and right, those are our bronchi. They're starting to essentially close up from time to time. They're swelling shut, okay? Now, it's the reason you hear the wheezing, it's the same thing if you were to blow over a glass bottle, right? If you blow over the glass bottle, it makes that kind of high pitch whistly sound. When we bronchospasm, our bronchioles are tightening down to the point they can't get air back out very well. So they can get air in, but when they go to exhale, it's that air hitting that bottle. It starts making that wheezing sound because it's too tight. Um, an example or another like maybe example is the, the old light bulb in the mouth argument. You guys heard about the light bulb thing? You can put a light bulb in your mouth, but you can't get it back out. Do not try it. You literally cannot get it back out, right? It's the same idea. Air can get in, but it can't get back out, okay? Also the light bulb things because your teeth. Can't get the, that loop past your teeth. Um, okay, so wheezing with asthma. So crackles. Crackles sounds kind of like Rice Krispies in the bowl, okay? You'll also hear crackles described as rails, R-A-L-E-S, okay? Can someone tell me what crackles means? Does anyone know? Fluid. Fluid, what is it? Fluid. Fluid, yeah. Crackles and rails means they have fluid in their lungs. You're gonna wanna note that, okay? It's gonna pay a, play a role later. Crackles, rails is fluid in the lungs. The next one is ronchi. So, take you to imagination land for a moment. You ever been to a truck stop? It's late in the evening. There's usually that one guy standing outside, real skinny, big barely chest, and he coughs and you can hear every sound his lungs have ever made for his whole life, right? That junky, gross, rattly sound. That's ronchi. Basically, it's mucus overfilling in the lungs, so it sounds, the, the descriptive word they use is junky, okay? Um, they just have a lot of mucus and nastiness in there, so you can kind of hear it. And I'll play different sound bites for you guys later when we get to respiratory where you can hear it a little better. And the last one, strider. So strider kind of sounds like wheezing. It's a similar idea to wheezing. 
the only difference is that Strider is one, the only upper airway sound we have, okay? But two, it's occurring in the throat. So wheezing is happening in our lungs, Strider is happening in our throat, okay? The reason we have Strider is usually because of choking or anaphylaxis, but airway compromise, usually if they're choking, right? Same idea with the wheezing, right? If they take that breath in, as they try to exhale that air hitting the beer bottle, or excuse me, glass bottle example, right? It makes that high pitched humming sound. Same thing in your throat. You can bring air in, but as you go to breathe air out, it makes a high pitch whistling sound, usually associated with either anaphylaxis or choking, okay? Now, I'm not expecting you guys to commit these two memories aggressively right now, but it will play a role down, uh, down the road. So if you start paying attention to it now, it could help you out later. Cardiovascular system stuff. Look for the trauma to the chest, listen for breath sounds, consider our pulse, respiratory rate, blood pressure, and then once again, rate, rhythm, quality. That's gonna also play a role with our breathing. We wanna know the rate, rhythm, and quality of their breaths as well. So cardiovascular system, right? We talked about it. Rate, rhythm, quality, once again, pulse and respiratory rate, both of which need to be um, looked at from that perspective, okay? Now, another part of cardiovascular, right? The skin, we talked about it with circulation. The skin can be a uh, indicator of poor cardiovascular function, right? If their circulation is poor, you gotta think about everything that encompasses circulation, right? Blood, vasculature, and our heart. All three of those components play a role in circulation, okay? Um, check and compare distal pulses, so you can feel pulses in both wrists, you can feel pulses in both feet. Okay, and then consider auscultation for abnormal heart sounds. Full transparency, I never really listen to heart tones. The only times I really listened to heart tones is when I was confirming a death, because if there was any sound, that meant they were not dead, right? Um, this one you won't do very often. Frankly, they don't educate us. They do teach us where to listen to them, but we don't really necessarily know what we're listening for, right? We just know the lub dub. That's that cardiologist level education. <clears throat> so pulse rates, don't worry about memorizing children's ones, okay? We will also get to the point later where we have a lecture on pediatrics. So we'll talk about these all then, okay? But for you guys, you gotta remember 60 to 100, okay? And then also just the idea, the younger the patient, typically the faster the pulse rate, right? If we look at this one, infants, normal heart rate range is 85 to 205, okay? We'll talk about why that is later. Um, pro tip, like I said, we don't re we don't rec or excuse me we don't require you to memorize these vital signs. Most people don't. For me, what I did on, in the field is I just had on my phone under Safari had a favorites page of just a table like this. So when I was dispatched to a potential four-year-old patient, I would look it up and be like, okay, so his vital should be in this kind of general range, okay? No one's expecting you to memorize them unless you're gonna go become peds related of some sort. Pulse quality, we talked about it, right? When we're feeling for that rate, rhythm, and quality, the quality describes how the pulse feels. So if it's a stronger than normal pulse, we describe it as bounding. If it's a pulse that when you go to feel it, it's really hard to find, where it's weak, okay, that's weak or thready, both of which will work, both mean weak pulse, okay? Rhythm, we want it to be at a, a specific interval, right? We want it to be contractions at the same time. Make sure it's a nice regular rhythm. Do I have anyone in here who has family that you know of who has atrial fibrillation or AFib? Anyone ever heard of that? You should ask your family members if anyone does. And if they do, you should ask to feel their pulse because it's not gonna be that consistent pulse rate. It'll be just kind of all over the place and it's, you can feel it being abnormal. You have a question? No, it's just Have you felt it? Yeah, it's super quick and like out of rhythm. Yeah, yeah feel her pulse, it's weird. It's, and, but that's a, good, that's a good thing for you to get familiar with because you will start to feel irregular pulses. Um, so if the heart periodically has an early or a late beat, or if they missed a heartbeat, right, that's an irregular rhythm. If you don't feel a pulse every so often consistently, right, I'm not giving a specific consistency to it because everyone's rates are kind of different, right, but we want it to be at a consistent rate, uh, rate. okay, almost at range. Um, do we need any clarification on blood pressure? 
Okay, so just remember if there's a drop in blood pressure, it can be a loss of blood, it can be a loss of vascular tone. When we're talking about vascular tone, we're talking about uh, vasoconstriction versus vasodilation, right? Is the vasculature able to adapt to that? And then the last portion is cardiac pumping problem. Is this a heart pump or pipes problem? Excuse me, pump, pump pipes or fluid, if we wanted to get specific. Decreased blood pressure, usually a late sign of shock. We'll talk about shock, I'm not super stressing that right now. An abnormally high blood pressure may result in a rupture or other critical damage in the arterial system. Now, just because you have a cranked up blood pressure for a moment does not mean this is happening to you. This is the people who live with hypertension for a long time. They start to develop problems, okay? Because that blood pressure just battering against their vasculature. Uh, blood pressure cuff, right? What's another word for a blood pressure uh, gauge? What is it? Sphygmomanometer, sphygmomanometer, yeah. I'm not gonna go into a blood pressure cuff, you've all played with them. Now remember there are two ways to manually get a blood pressure. Auscultation and palpation. Auscultation, we're listening, right? We put our stethoscope in, we take a blood pressure. Palpation, we're feeling the pulse. We're gonna crank up that blood pressure cuff. When we lose a pulse, we're gonna start to open it up slowly. And then the second we feel the first pulse, we wanna look in at the sphygmomanometer dial, right? And whatever that number is, is gonna be our systolic number. So when you first feel a pulse, that number is your systolic, okay? Um, and then you will be using probably when you get to the field automated, unless you go somewhere like Boise Fire where they take nothing but manual vital signs. Okay, they take nothing but manual blood pressures, which I appreciate because usually they're pretty, they're pretty accurate with it. And then remember hyper, hypotension. What's our normal blood pressure? 120 over 80, right? So what's hypo, can someone give me an example of a hypotensive pressure? 100 over 60, what about a hypertensive? 140 over 120, yeah. Um, typical rule of thumb too, food for thought, the lower the diastolic number, the lower the bottom number, the better your cardiac health is typically. That's what they say. I don't know who they are, but that's what they say. Okay, neurologic system. So we're talking about nerves, brain, okay should be performed with any patient who has changes in mental status, possible head injury, uh, stupor, meaning that they, they're kind of out of it, right? Dizziness, drowsiness, and then syncope. Does somebody know what syncope means? Does anyone know the term fallout? They done fell out? What does that mean? Passed out. So syncope means they passed out. Okay, you'll be dispatched to syncopal episodes from time to time. Syncope just means passing out. <clears throat> now for neuro, evaluate the level of consciousness, their orientation, right? We're gonna go through AVPU, we're gonna go through the ANO questions, okay? Um, and then there's another way to, to tell with their mental status, it's called the GCS or the Glasgow Coma Scale. We are expecting you guys to know that. Um, I'm not gonna talk about it right now, but I wanna give everyone just a little peace of mind already. You are gonna be expected to calculate a GCS for your trauma assessment near the end of the course. Now, where it comes, where I'm being nice to you is I'm gonna give you a table so you can calculate an accurate one. Okay, I'm actually gonna give you the little sheet that tells you what the numbers are, but you are expected. But we'll talk about GCS a little bit down the road. It doesn't really play a role quite yet. Not, not where we're at. Okay, any questions so far on neuro? Okay, so moving to the eyes. The pupil, the black center portion of our eye, normally round and approximately equal size, right between the left and the right eyes. So remember we have pupillary dilation and constriction. To dilate is to open up, to constrict is to tighten up, right? So if we have, um, with our pupils, say we, say we walk into a dark room, what do you think our pupils are gonna do? Dilate. Dilate, they're gonna get really big, why? Yeah, they're trying to gather as much light as they possibly can to see. Versus, you know, you middle of the night, you walk into the bathroom, flip that light on, you can't see. What do you think your pupils are doing? Constricting, right? Because they're like, this is too much light, we do not need this much light to see. Um, 
Now, I learned this last year and I really wish I'd known it before. If you wanna know what the brain is doing, look at the eyes, okay? If we have pupils of uneven sizes, that could be normal or it could be a sign of a head injury. What is the sign for uh, an opiate overdose with our eyes? Not wide, what is it? Pinpoint, very small. Pinpoint pupils, very small pupils are opiates. Wide dilated pupils, that's like cocaine, methamphetamine, upper stuff. Yeah, but you can get a lot of inclinations about what's going on with this call by looking at their eyes. So um, different, different examples, right? So constricted, those are still not as small as I've seen. They get pretty small when people overdose on opiates, smaller than that. Uh, the next one down, that's gonna be your dilated. So if they're on something like ecstasy, methamphetamine, cocaine, their eyes will get really big. And then that bottom one, unequal pupils, okay? That is usually a sign of a head injury. Now, I will say I had one experience that changed my whole perspective on eyes. If you see those uneven pupils, ask the questions, is that normal? Because I noticed with a gentleman, I pulled him out into the rig. It wasn't until he turned and I really looked at his eyes that I saw one of his pupils was giant. I was like, oh man, I missed something. So I asked him, you know, it's like, uh, is that normal? And before I could even finish my, my thought, he's like, oh, my eye, yeah, I got hit with a rubber band when I was a kid, so it, it tore my iris. I was like, oh, well, okay. Then I know that's not a problem, right? But looking at the eyes will tell you a lot. Um, this is called, if you guys are curious, anascoria. Anascoria is having different sized pupils. Does anyone know what it's called when you have two different colored eyes? Hetero, or excuse, yeah, heterochromia. Hetero meaning different, right? And chromia being color. Heterochromia means they have two different color eyes. Like David Bowie, he's heterochromia or hat heterochromia. So a um, small number of the pupils will exhibit, or excuse me, a small number of the population will exhibit unequal pupil sizes. That's that anascoria I was telling you about, okay? And then different causes. So injury to the brain or brainstem, trauma stroke, brain tumor, inadequate oxygenation or perfusion, usually of the brain, and then drugs or toxins, okay? All of those complaints though, if we're looking at them objectively, we can pretty much say those are gonna affect, every one of those is gonna affect the brain though, right? Each and every one of those is a brain related thing. So the eyes, once again, are telling us what the brain is going through. We're paying attention to it. And then this is the mnemonic we use for eyes, pearl, okay? Pupils equal and round and regular in size, reactive to light, P-E-A-R-R-L. Pupils equal and round, regular in size, reactive to light. Okay. This is for normal pupils. All of your, your eyes right now, all your pupils right now are little pearls. Aww. But yeah, pearls, pearl. Questions, comments, concerns on this? Okay. Uh, neurovascular status. So when we're talking about their brain to how is their vasculature functioning, okay? Can someone tell me a condition that would affect a neurovascular status? A stroke. a stroke, right? If they're having a stroke, that's a neuro problem that's having to do with vasculature, okay? So you might have, to, or you're gonna have to check for bilateral muscle strength and weakness, right? People having a stroke are gonna be weaker on one side. Uh, you can test for pain, sensations, and position. You can compare distal and proximal sensory and motor responses on one side and then compare them to the other, right? So can you feel me touching you here? Can you feel me touching you here? Another thing I used to do is I'd take my pen, I wouldn't click it so I wouldn't draw, but I would drag it. Tell me when you start feeling or stop feeling. And then we'd compare it on both arms, okay? Um, I've even heard people doing it with a needle, taking a needle and just not poking them, but scratching them lightly with it. Can you feel this? Can you feel that, right? And checking the different areas. Yeah. Um, okay, so anatomic regions, head, neck, C-spine. So palpate the skull and the scalp, check the eyes, check the color of the sclera. What's the sclera? It's an anatomic term for a part of our eye. It's the white. The what? It's the white. It's the white. Yeah, the sclera is the white of our eyes. Yeah, look at the sclera. Uh, feel their cheekbones, right? Do we have any facial trauma? And then check their ears and nose for fluid. We'll go into speci uh, more specifics on that one in the next 
uh, and the trauma set of things, okay? But checking their ears and nose for fluid. But even we could say pretty generally blood too, right? If blood's coming out of someone's ears or nose, that's usually not a good sign. Nose maybe, but ears for sure. Um, upper, so check the upper and lower jaw, right? The maxilla being the upper jaw, the mandible being the lower jaw. Open their mouth, look for any broken or missing teeth. Do we have any unusual odors in the mouth? I would argue that not every unusual odor is noteworthy, right? They ate a bunch of onions or garlic, maybe not a noteworthy odor. But if we, like, you smell pennies in their mouth, yeah, that's a different thing, right? Maybe blood. Um, for the chest, inspect, visualize, palpate. We're looking for uh, both sides of the chest rising and falling together. What's another term for that? Bilateral, Bilateral right? What do, what do we call it if only one side is moving? Unilateral. Unilateral, very good. And then observe for abnormal breathing signs, so retractions, accessory muscle usage, okay? For the abdomen, Palpate for tenderness, rigidity, and guarding. Now, guarding I've heard described a few different ways. I've heard guarding described as when you go to palpate somebody and they put their hands in front, like they're physically guarding it. I've also heard guarding when you go to palpate and they like they flex. You know, when like you something hurts and someone touches it, you kind of flex, right? So I've I've heard both definitions. I tend to go towards the the flex one more so than physically guarding. Okay, so if you go to palpate someone and they flex their abs they're probably in some discomfort, okay? And then four quadrants, left upper, left lower, right upper, right lower. When we start an assessment on quadrants, we'll talk about this again later. Wherever their pain is starting, we're gonna move to the area next to it. We're gonna start at the area next to it, so that way we go in a full circle and end where it hurts. Why do you think we do that? How do you think my assessment's gonna go if I go and push on their stomach right where they hurt immediately? Right, they're gonna say ow every single time I touch them after that. Okay, so start where it doesn't hurt and work your way back to where it does hurt. Okay, that'll, that'll give you a more accurate uh, and frankly honest assessment of it. Pelvis, we're looking for symmetry. Any obvious signs of bleeding and deformity? Extremities, arms, legs, symmetry, right? We want them to be the same lengths, or at least their normal lengths. Um, cuts, bruises, swelling, obvious injuries, bleeding. Palpate for deformities. I will, I can honestly say a deformity you're going to inspect long before you palpate, right? If you show up and someone's right arm is in a lightning bolt, you probably don't need to touch it a whole lot to know what's going on with it, right? And then check for pulses and motor and sensory function. We will talk about that when we introduce skills next Monday. Okay, but CMS, PMS. You're gonna check pulses, you can even check cap refill. Can you feel me touching you? Can you wiggle your fingers, okay? And it's important to do that, especially when we're splinting. You're gonna do it before and after you splint. Why do you think we're gonna check before and after we splint? Yeah, yeah we, did we make a mistake? Right? If we had a pulse, all those things were intact, then we splint and then we check again and all those things are gone, we probably did something wrong. Right? So that's gonna be the, the purpose behind that. But like I said, I'll introduce, introduce that next week. And then the posterior, so decap BTLS, symmetry, open wounds, and then palpate the spine from neck to pelvis for tenderness and deformity. When you guys palpate down the back, you're gonna to be touching every single vertebrae. Right, you guys can feel in your own back your vertebral prominence or prominence, right? The uh, the point of your vertebrae that's poking out towards your back. You're going to touch each and every one of those, okay? And then when we're feeling down there, the description we use is we're looking for step offs. Do I feel a part where it's not symmetrical? It's I have to push further in, or one part of the vertebrae are out further, right? That's a step off. Of course, because I clicked on something else. Okay, okay. Okay, so some of the vital stuff, we've definitely talked about these. Um, what I wanna say about these pulse ox, pulse ox things. One, pulse ox is a fairly unreliable vital sign. Okay, for that thing to work, there's a little laser that's reading through it. So if they're cold, you're gonna get a poor reading. If there's too much light, you're gonna get a poor reading. If they have fingernail polish on, you're gonna get a poor reading. Okay, if their hands are dirty, Maybe you're dealing with the homeless crowd, right? Their hands are gonna be dirty, you're gonna get a poor reading, okay? 
So this can be an unreliable vital sign. With all of your vital signs, I want you guys to get into the mentality we are gonna be reading our patient and not just the vitals, okay? Because there have been times where I've been you know, writing my chart, I got a patient in front of me, I see an alarm and it's like, their heart rate is 190. And I look and they're like looking at me like, what's up? You know, and say, like, I don't believe that number. And I feel a pulse and sure enough, they've just been moving their finger or something, giving me a weird number, okay? So read your patient, not your vital signs, okay? Uh, also, just historically, these little handheld SPO2s that you get from like Walgreens are not that reliable either. Like I've had patients who called us because they, that little machine says their oxygen's 88. I put mine on and it says 98, okay? It's just sometimes you're gonna have to work through that. They're not always the greatest. Um, remember with pulse ox, it's measuring sat oxygen saturation of hemoglobin, okay? And it doesn't have to be oxygen saturation so much. It's reading how much of our hemoglobin is full. Okay, that's why things like carbon monoxide can be dangerous because they fill up our hemoglobin. Our SpO2 says 100%, but is that oxygen? It's carbon monoxide, right? So they're not actually breathing oxygen right now, which we'll talk about when we get down the road. Uh, patients will, with difficulty breathing should receive oxygen regardless of their pulse ox. If, you, if you're on scene with a patient who is struggling to breathe, you're never gonna be wrong for giving them oxygen. Okay, you're never gonna be wrong. Um, capnography, <clears throat> we read this as the end tidal. Okay, what is the end tidal CO2 measure? Does anyone know? End tidal CO2. Based on the name, you could have a guess. Hmm? The oxygen. Not the oxygen. Was it? End tidal of what molecule though? Oh, carbon dioxide, yeah. So we're reading how much carbon dioxide are they breathing off per breath? Okay, that's the one that was ranged 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. Okay, and then our blood glucose, what's our normal blood glucose range? If you know blood pressure, you know the glucose range. 80 to 120, right? Blood pressure is 120 over 80, our blood sugar range is 80 to 120. Okay, so if they're at 100, that's normal. If they're at 60, they're hypoglycemic. If they're at 180, they're hyperglycemic. Right, you see how that works with their sugars? High and low. And that, yeah, blood pressure cuffs are non-invasive. You guys, the most invasive procedure you guys will do um, is OPAs, MPAs, and then uh, wound packing if you do that. Okay, we're getting near the end. So reassessment. We will reassess on regular intervals depending on our patient's needs. Okay, so um, with a critical patient, if somebody is in uh, an unstable vital sign set, an unstable presentation, does anyone know how frequently we're gonna reassess them? Five Every five minutes, yeah. Every five minutes. What about if they're in a stable condition? We have time, we're not in a huge rush. How often do you think we need to reassess? 15. 15. Yeah, I learned the number 10 and five, but 15 is the new normal. So for a stable patient, you will reassess every 15 minutes. For an unstable patient, you will reassess every five. Now, to put your minds at ease a little bit, when you guys get out in the field, you'll be using monitors. Your monitors can be programmed so that every, however many minutes you want, it'll take another set of vitals for you. Okay, so you can have recurring vitals based on your complaints, based on the times you need without you even having to think about it, okay? Um, da, da, da. Reassess vital signs, so compared with baseline vital signs, obtained during the pr uh, primary assessment, and then look for trends. Okay, so you're gonna get your first set of vitals and then you're gonna reassess them every five or 15 depending on what the issue needs. Okay, and then we're gonna be looking for trends. We wanna see is that blood pressure trending downward? Every five minutes I take a new blood pressure, it's lower and lower and lower, or higher and higher and higher, right? We can take track of all of our vitals. If they're starting to trend downward, we're gonna need to drive faster or get involved a little bit. Uh, you're gonna reassess the chief complaint so ask and answer the following questions. Is the current treatment improving the patient's condition? Did we do something that's helping this patient? Okay, a good example would be things like a blood sugar. We show up, they have a low blood sugar. We then give them a sandwich. We recheck their blood sugar in 10 minutes and their sugar's better, right? We can watch that trend. We can see if anything or the things we're doing are actually helping, okay? 
Has an already identified problem gotten better? Has it gotten worse, right? You're gonna have to ask both questions. Um, there will be times, no matter what you're doing, they're gonna continue to get worse. People die all the time, okay? Um, I'm even gonna do that with scenarios for you guys from time to time. You'll be running a scenario and you'll think you're doing really well and then every time you get a vital sign, it's gonna be going down and down and down. Nothing that you're doing wrong, it's just the way things are. People die, okay? And then when the, uh, what is the nature of the new, newly identified problem? Okay, is this gonna be a mechanism or is this gonna be a nature of illness type thing? Uh, recheck our interventions. So interventions are the things we do, right? So giving medications, giving oxygen, putting a blanket on somebody, positioning them supine, all are interventions. So anything we do for the patient is an intervention, okay? Now, most important, ABCs. What does ABC stand for again? Very good, airway, breathing, circulation. So ensure management of bleeding and then ensure adequacy of other interventions and consider the need for new interventions. Is what we're doing working or do we need to do something different? Uh, a good example, what I used to do when I was in the field quite a bit, when I was dealing with people who were breathing okay, I would start them on a nasal cannula. Maybe start them at two or three liters per minute. After five to 10 minutes, I'd look at them. Is that helping them at all? Because I can always change it. I can go up to a non-rebreather, right? Or if that's not working, I can go up to CPAP. I would start small and raise every single time. Okay, we can always add more interventions. We can't take stuff away. Once we've given a medication, that's in there. Okay, can never give, you can't take it away. You can always give more, but you can't take it away, okay? And then identify and treat changes in the patient's condition. So document any changes, positive or negative. Remember, it is a legal document, so you're gonna need that um, official. And then unstable patients, you're gonna reassess approximately every five. Stable, approximately every 15, okay? As the situation demands.